Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of the Monsters, Dan. Yes, it's Thursday night. We've got in the co-captain's chair, Mr. Dan Brown and Hitch himself, Jamie Laszlo. We good? We're good. <laughs> oh, Jamie always comes prepared with some cool stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. Go ahead. Yeah, there you go. I know. I just I got a pointer. You got, he's got a pointer too. All right. So uh, in case you haven't figured it out, this is the show we've been talking about doing for a quite a while now, because uh, we've had plenty of people ask over the last few months, do you guys like Alfred Hitchcock? Are you ever going to do an Alfred Hitchcock show? Well, as it turns out, the three of us are pretty big Alfred Hitchcock fans. So what we have tasked ourselves with is to go through that immense filmography of Alfred Hitchcock and somehow figure out a way to rank our 10 favorites. Uh, I think once I finally figured out what the 10 favorites were going to be, it's like, all right, what order do I put these in? Does it even really matter? But I kind of kind of think I got mine down pretty well, and uh, I'm sure you guys do as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to count down from 10 all the way back to number one. We're each going to kind of go round and round. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the film. We won't tell too much about the film, but I'm sure we've got some factoids and information about the plot and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to go, we're going to start with Hitch himself down in the corner. So we'll go Jamie, Dan, myself, and then we'll continue going round and round until we get to number one. So Jamie, kick us off. All with right. 10. Like you said, I don't want to give any spoilers. I just want to talk about the movies without giving spoilers, but I'm probably going to give a few. In that case, I have this. <laughs> and the viewer, you out there, when I put this up, you can mute me. And then when I put it down, unmute me. The spoiler's over. I'll try my best to remember. We'll see how it goes. It went pretty bad in rehearsal. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids. Number 10. <laughs> The lady vanishes. The lady vanishes. Number 10. So um, while, while on a train in Europe, a young girl realizes that an older woman disappears on the train. And once she disappears, the rest of the people on the train don't remember seeing her. A pretty cool premise. I, I believe it was a novel. You know, I normally hide my notes. Right now, my notes are here for everyone to see. So talking points. Characters and a toy box. Toy box. Why is, why is that there? Because in the beginning, when all the characters are in the hotel or the lodge or whatever it is, they're all interacting with one another. There's a lot of comedy. This might be the first movie where there's a lot of comedy in a Hitch movie. Uh, it's almost like Hitch is having fun with these characters and making them interact. Almost like when I used to take my Star Wars figures out of my toy box or toy closet and make them interact. He's having fun, you can tell. And hence, Hitch's sense of humor, which goes to these two guys, Charters and Caldecott, the most British name in the history of British names. <laughs> now here they are in bed together, sharing the same PJs, if you can see. Now, not only in this scene are they in bed together, one wearing the top PJs, the other one wearing the bottom PJs, but in this scene, they are looking at a woman coming into their room who's flirting with them and wants to change in front of them. And what do they do? They run out the door, <laughs> flabbergasted. <laughs> and people got a rise out of this. I think these two guys got a rise from one another, if you know what I mean. <laughs> They were into cricket, but I think they were into each other's crickets as well. <laughs> so I think this is a very early example of a gay couple in a movie. One thing I've learned over the past month of watching Hitchcock movies, he does nothing by accident. Yeah. Nothing. I, I just think people were naive in 1938 because these two guys showed up for 10 years in more movies acting as the same type of characters. They just pop up and people would love it. So Star Trek is next. Why do I have Star Trek here? Do you guys watch Star Trek Next Generation? Oh, there is an episode. Oh, you're missing out, Pete. There's an episode called Star Trek Next Generation. Remember me. 
And down here is Beverly Crusher, the doctor. You can't see, but that's all right. I can see. And a old professor of hers is coming on the ship to visit. And what happens to him? He disappears. And what happens to everyone else in the ship? They don't remember him being on the ship ever. You got to think it came from this, right? Of course, a lot of crazy Star trek -y shit happens after that. But the main premise had to come from here. And that will not be my last Star Trek reference tonight, <laughs> believe wow, it or not. Good. Number 10. Very cool. Good film. Good film. All right, Dan, what do you got for number 10? Well, I'm going to add a couple of things to what Jamie said. And it's true. Charters and Calvicott, they've always been, and his, Hitchcock <laughs> liked to push the envelope in sexual innu innuendos, comedy, whatever. But he did it subtly. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he did North by Northwest in the end of the film, where you see the, they're going to consummate their relationship and the train goes into the tunnel. He was said to have said, oh, I pulled off a naughty, you know, like this. But anyhow, getting my Carter, Chatters and Calga, they, they were incredibly popular in England. And they ended up, uh, they ended up in the next, they did a film of their own called Crook's Tour as their characters. They appear in a film called Night Train to Munich, which is not a Hitchcock, it's a Carol Reed, a, based on Carol Reed works, works. And they're very good in that. But they became at a point where they didn't own the rights and they appeared as the same characters over numerous films, as Jamie said, over the years under different names. But everybody knew that they were Charters and Caldecott. Their career ended the 1980s in the BBC or ITV, one of the British networks, where they did a six part miniseries in which they played Charters and Caldecott as, as older gentlemen. And they have to solve a mystery. But anyhow, getting back to, I just want to add into that. Uh, I like to add things in because I, you know, I, 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 I solved this mystery. There you go. Um, yeah. Was, you know, while you were going through the whole plot of the whole thing, you like the hearts. I got hearts around. <laughs> I got everything. <laughs> but I, you know, I never know. I never noticed the. I never noticed one had the top and one had the bottom. That yeah. kind of hinges on. That hinges on like thirties, like creepy. Yeah. You yeah. Know. He was the top. He was the bottom. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Which is explaining a lot. Maybe he's the top and the bottom. Who knows? I, you know, it's very strange. But anyhow, go ahead, Peter. I was going to say, if you guys, I don't know if you guys read any like uh, kind of pulp fiction and stuff, but there's the old uh, 30s classic hero, the Avenger. And the origin of the Avenger, it's a very similar thing. And him and his wife and child go on a plane. And then some stuff happens and he gets knocked out and he wakes up and says, like, well, where? And my, his wife and child are gone and everybody's on the plane. Well, you came onto the plane by yourself. There was no wife and child. And he's like, no, that's not true. It's exactly right. Yeah. And we're talking right about the same time. So I'm, I'm trying, you know, I don't remember if yeah. the Avenger series was because it was right around the same time as the mm -hmm. Doc Savage uh, pulp story. Right. So it might have might have predated the lady vanishes so I'm not, I'm not really sure but it's right around that same time well didn't they didn't they play that off in the film unknown with liam neeson a few years ago yeah yeah where yeah. it was kind of a similar thing were you here did it really happen so anyhow it's, it's a cool get, thing regardless of how many yeah, times oh, it's yeah. a great idea they, get here? they yeah. can recycle it a hundred times I'm fine. oh yeah sure. but we have to we, we we can blame hitchcock for really like planting the seeds yeah exactly. um Anyhow, so I go to my number 10 and my, my number, my 10 films, like, first off, may I preface this by saying, in my estimation, I've been a huge Hitchcock fan my entire life. And in my estimation, there is no such thing as a bad Hitchcock. Uh, there is a lesser Hitchcock in his films, but a bad Hitchcock would sometimes be other directors high point of their career. That's very possible. But that being said, my, my 10, I don't have them in order because by putting them in order, it would stress me out to the point of taking heavy, heavily psychotic meds uh, because I would shift things around. This is on, this is off, this is here. And so I'm, gonna, I'm telling a story with mine and I'm gonna begin in 1926 with The Lodger. Ooh, good one. And that's my number 10, but not necessarily number 10. Um, and the reason why The Lodger is this kind of sets the precedent what Hitchcock does. In reality, the lodger is wrong man pursued or wrong man being convinced. But the beautiful thing about the lodger is it sets the precedent of his style. And the style being, he loved to tell stories visually, not necessarily dialogue wise. There's some nifty dialogue, but you could tell more with the story. And why he got into this is he started in the films in 1920. And his job early on in Germany 
and when he went to England was because he had a very artistic hand, he would design the title cards for between and silent films where it would say, Bill said, or whatever it may be. And he watched and he observed and realized that film is a visual medium. And when you're showing a picture um, and then all of a sudden you stop and show a dialogue card, it breaks the action. You got to focus back into the picture. And the most perfect example of this in the lodger is that he, there are people in the house, they have a lodger in the building who's a person who's come to rent an apartment uh, during a time when there is a serial killer, okay, Jack the Ripper going on. And there's a sequence where they're sitting in their living room and they look up at the ceiling and they're concerned. And all of a sudden the ceiling turns from a solid ceiling into a glass pane. And you see the lodger nervously pacing his apartment, his room. So basically did not break the action and this was unprecedented. And they filmed it by using like a five or six inch thick glass floor that they, you know, they built. But he felt you could tell more with that instead of cutting and saying, what's going on up there? And then showing him walking, you kept the suspense. But that being said, it's other than that, The Lodger is his first film that really launched him or started him on this amazing path that every one of his decades he worked with was watching his path grow, watch him evolve. But Lodger is number 10, a great film, available online, but it's also on Criterion, which I always recommend to buy the Criterion disc. That is true. It's the only silent movie I've seen by, by him. Many of the many of those silence, the Pleasure Garden is great, but there's there's a, they're they're kind of they're kind of choppy. There's it's it's you know, but it's every 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 film you see him in the silent era, you watch his style evolve. Right. Especially in the 30s in Britain. And he actually repeated a lot of the 30s uh, going forward that he did in Britain that American audiences did not really see and saw how it took to American audiences. But. Yeah. And the lodge has been uh, remade numerous times by Hitch himself. Actually, they made a sound, they made a sound version in the early 30s Very starring good. Ivor Novello, yeah. who played in the lodger. And they asked Hitchcock to direct the sound version. And he said no. And the film bombed. Yeah. And this was the established star of this now. P.S. Ivor Novello was a big matinee idol in the 20s in England, also appeared as an, appears in one of his silent films called Downhill as well. So he had a relationship with actors, even in Britain in the 20s. Yep. Cool. All right. My number 10, 1954 is Dial M for Murder. All right. Um, Starring Grace Kelly, the lovely Grace Kelly. Has she ever looked lovelier? I don't know. This is a rear window, right? Um, Ray Milan, Robert Cummins, Cummings, John Williams. Uh, a very cool film because it's based on a play. And like the play, they decided to shoot the entire film, well, 98% of the film, all in the one apartment setting. So basically, they would take you from room to room to room, but that was it. Most of this film uh, in that apartment, I think there is uh, one quick scene where they're out in front of the building. Um, but for the most part, everything kind of took place in the apartment or in the stairway or hallway outside the apartment. One restaurant scene. Yes, that is true. Yep, yep. There's, yeah, I was trying to think what the other one was. It was at the police station, it was the restaurant scene, something like that. Um, but basically the story, uh, Ray Milan plays a retired tennis player. He's married to this uh, very rich beauty. And that's, of course, Grace Kelly. Uh, he finds out that she is having an affair with a writer. That's Robert Cummings. And of course, he's not too happy about that. So he plots this whole uh, idea to hire some schleppy murderer guy to off his wife. Okay, one night where he goes out to the to the ballot wherever the hell he goes out so i forget exactly where he goes she they convinces her to stay home and of course the the guy breaks into the house he doesn't have to break in actually because a key is left for him out outside in the hallway he breaks in he tries to go kill uh grace kelly's character but in actuality he winds up getting killed himself all right so this unfolds this whole other plot line where now they're trying the police are trying to you know pin murder on her there you go. Spoilers. There you go. So that's, that's <laughs> I'm a little late. <laughs> that's all right. Well, because I'm not going to go any further because that that's basically that's the gist of the whole film. And now it's it, they're uh, trying to she's trying to figure out how, you know, she was basically acting in self-defense. Right. So and then the whole rest of the movie is 
uh, how how is this all going to play out? Is uh, you know Ray Milan's character going to get her put in jail? Uh, but she's still alive now, so obviously he's not going to inherit the money with her still around. And how's this going to unfold? Uh, it's a, a fascinating, fascinating film that keeps you on the edge of your seat. The acting is great. Uh, the characters are, I mean, they all look great, right? It's just, um, and the wonderful Grace Kelly is just mesmerizing in this film. And uh, props to Ray Milan, who is like a very, very fine actor uh, who does a great job in this film. He's just kind of always calm, cool, and collected. You can always tell he's got a lot of things going on in his mind, right? How, and how this is moving along. But at the same time, his whole plot is like slipping beneath his fingers and then you know how how is this all going to work out well you're going to have to watch the film and see i won't give any more away but excellent excellent movie check it out if you haven't i like that movie a lot and this is not a bad thing to say it reminds me of a really good columbo episode where you see mm -hmm. the murder and then you see how they solve the murder that's a good point. I was I was lucky enough. I actually down at Eighth Street Playhouse in the Greenwich Village, they uh, every year would have a 3D film festival, and they showed films in the traditional 3D sense. And I was very lucky to see Dial M for Murder in 3D on the big screen, and it plays well. And he, you know, Hitchcock grasped the 3D concept very. Oh, you saw it in th oh 3D. It's in 3D. Now, is that on a 3D TV? Do you have the glasses? Well, they have they have both versions. So, of course, I don't have okay. a 3D TV, so I just watch so there it. Are no, okay, so I've well, seen you, it. You saw, you, know, you saw it on your cinema-worthy television right now. I get it. <laughs> but also, it was remade, and it was remade in the 90s with uh, Michael Douglas as the perfect murder. So it was remade at one point, but a great film, nonetheless. All right, number nine. Yes, indeedy. My biggest fear is all these fall in the middle of us taping. Number nine. Very well with this. Ah. The Man Who Knew Too Much. The 1956 version. Because Hitch made it in 1934. And Hitch said, the first one was done by an amateur. The second one was done by a professional. So an American couple in Morocco or mistakenly get involved in an attempt to assassinate a statesman. So what do we got here? We got a lot of music in this movie. I mean, the opening fanfare, you see it performed live. And then writing comes up that says, life changes with the clash of the symbols or something like that. And Hank and his mom, the little kid and Doris Day, they bond over music because Josephine is a singing star. And one, two, three. Towards the end, Hank hears his mom singing downstairs while he's held captive upstairs, and she hears him whistling so they can find him. So music, the assassination itself deals with music because the gunshot's supposed to go off during a cymbal crash. And you see, during the concert, the notes going by. And the notes become the anticipation as the viewer and the suspense instead of seeing someone running down a hall you see notes going by you know the symbol crash is coming up so it works really well a lot of music and there's a lot of fade outs in this movie a lot of weird fade outs and i found out now this is just i don't know if this is true but i found out that the screenwriter they had the opening part of this movie written, and then the rest of the script was airmailed in as they taped, filmed the movie. So it makes me wonder, <laughs> did they do a fade out and say, we got no more script, guys? <laughs> oh, we got the mail. <laughs> Roll them. I don't know. No. But that's the feeling I get. The ending reminds me of two other Hitchcock movies, Saboteur and Notorious. Why Saboteur? Because the end involves a big house party and our heroes wanting to get out of the house party and notorious because of the big suspenseful coming down the stairs scene. And there's a little bit of Indiana Jones in this movie. Because the killing of Louis Bernard, they actually reenacted it in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And let me show you. I don't have a great picture. But that, Steven Spielberg purposely okay. reenacted it. And I swear to God, when James Stewart is walking 
into the chapel in the middle of the movie, the score sounds the same as the Stafford Ross score. No, no. I, I, I watched this movie a few times and every time it gets to that part, it hits my brain, ah, Indiana Jones. Plus the whole first third of this movie, when they're in Africa, Morocco, it, the setting, you almost imagine Indiana Jones running in the background. <laughs> it looks like an Indiana Jones movie. It's true, yep. yep. Yeah, so there you go. I'm out of talking points. Number nine. That's a good one. That's a good one. Me? Am I up? Oh yeah. my God. Who else is on the show? Um, <laughs> anyway, no, it's amazing how many directors are influenced by Hitchcock and they pay homage to him. And it's funny when Jamie sat there and said something about did they phone in or they were sending in the script as they went along. Um, not, to, not to segue away from Hitchcock, but another great director. The film Hidden Fortress done by Akira Kurosawa, which George Lucas has proclaimed that it was a major influence on Star Wars. And what had happened is Kurosawa would sit there and purposely end each segment on a cliffhanger when he filmed for the day. And then he had the writers go in that night and he lit them in these amazing cliffhangers. How are they gonna get out of this? And he tasked his writers to come up that night with an escape. And they would sit through the night and try to come up with, how are they gonna get out of this? And that's just how some directors work. But it's funny because Hitchcock was very much meticulous. His things, his things were storyboarded. I mean, he, he was meticulous from day one to day 10 on the scene, on the filming. But anyhow, enough said, enough said about that. Um, my number nine is something that Jamie mentioned, that's Saboteur. And Saboteur is not a powerful Hitchcock film. It's not, in many stretches of the imagination. Uh, personally, myself, like I'm a big film buff or, uh, you know, and my favorite era of films are basically from the silent era up to the big studio systems. And then I started learning to appreciate noir and so forth and so on. And trust me, I love a good slasher as the next guy. But that being said, Saboteur uh, was his first, although he made a film called uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith in 1941, which was a comedy and a non-Hitchcock film. Uh, Saboteur was his first real American Hitchcock film because Rebecca had British cast, took place in England. Suspicion had a British cast, took place in England. So Saboteur is an American film. And the beauty of that film is that, and I'm a big fan, my subgenre that I love so much is the films of World War II, which play off on a propaganda angle on how America's top, you know, the topical uh, approach to films during World War II, as propaganda was done in Japan and Germany, no matter where it was. And I kind of like World War II films. And this film, I believe that the first opening X amount of minutes when you introduce Saboteur, which is about a fellow wrong man being pursued, which is his usual, which has been had been taken back as far as, um, for God's sakes, 39 Steps, uh, Young and Innocent, all these films in England. This was his first way to identify and approach Americans to his stylization and his quirks, the way he liked to make films, the storyline. So here it is, Robert Cummings, who was in Dial M for Murder, um, plays this hero who has been falsely accused of blowing up a airplane factory or a saboteur. Yep, there you go. And he spends the rest of the film on the run, like the fugitive, trying to convince his innocence. Uh, the first 10 minutes or so of the buildup from the opening credits to the explosion at the factory, uh, to him finally getting on a truck and trying to go are awesome. The way it works, it plays itself out. Even meeting with the fellow who died, who was his best friend, meeting with the mother and explaining he didn't do it. Then in the middle, it gets kind of weird and dodgy. It just kind of, you know, he's playing around. It, it's not that tight. But then the last 15 minutes of the film where there's a second, second sabotage attempt and as Jamie said, there's a thing trying to get out of a party, a second sabotage attempt, and the great sequence of all time that takes place on the Statue of Liberty. I won't say what happens in case we're in a ruin for somebody. If anybody hasn't seen it, you know what you're missing. 
but the 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 the, fault, the failing parts on that is Robert Cummings is not a really hard, strong leading man. Uh, he's not. Um, but other than that, you got Otto Kruger, and this will be. I'm going to call this. I'm going to do as Jamie says, spoilers, whatever he does. I'm going to have the six degrees of separation of Monsters Den, so we make sure that everybody who wants the Monsters Den who may not like Hitchcock will say, oh, there's a monster association with this, okay? First of all, we got Otto Kruger as this big owner of a ranch uh, who is, you know, put it not bluntly, he's a scumbag, you know, that's what it is. But he played in Dracula's daughter as the hero. And the first cop that arrests him uh, before he does this, uh, Robert Cummings, where this epic jump off of a bridge is the actor by the name of Matt Willis who played Bela Lugosi's werewolf sidekick in return of the vampire so those are our monsters den six degrees of kevin bacon separation including monsters and so forth but it's a great film and also it started the relationship with norman lloyd who plays the saboteur and had a long prolific uh, relationship with hitchcock uh, who helped produce direct he was on saint elsewhere he just died recently at the age of 106 Wow. wow. You died, he, was a, he died of 106 years old, but he was on St. Elsewhere as a major character. But he was very much hand in hand with Hitchcock um, during uh, the, the series, the Alfred Hitchcock Presents. He produced, he directed, been a number of films, but that was his first role. And, Al, and, and Norman Lloyd, by the way, had come from the school. He came here with the Mercury Theater, which is um, Orson Welles's group, to come to Hollywood. And the role he got in Saboteur was recommended by John Houseman, who was Orson Welles' partner in the Mercury Theater. Uh, he did not appear, he was supposed to appear in Citizen Kane, but he didn't. And then John Houseman, he came out to California, John Houseman went to Hitchcock and said, look, I'd like to recommend this guy, Norman Lloyd. And Norman Lloyd played the Saboteur and his career was set, but he had a long standing personal relationship with Hitchcock. But Saboteur, uh, number two, not a great film, but it's got some of those early, you know, things he did in England that he's trying to transgress over into the American cinema. And it works well. I personally like it. It's an adventure film. There you go. I dig it too. All right, my number nine, 1941. I've often thought, who is my favorite leading man? in Alfred Hitchcock films. There's two guys who appeared quite a bit. It's either Jimmy Stewart or Cary Grant, right? I'm a big Cary Grant fan. Uh, Suspicion is my next choice. So uh, here we have uh, Cary Grant, Joan Fontaine, Sir Cedric Hardwick, also appeared in lots of other films. Uh, Nigel Bruce, the bumbling Nigel Bruce, right? Plays Beaky in this film. Uh, this is a very cool movie. Uh, I, I just watched this again just a couple days ago. And uh, it's a psychological thriller. So basically, Cary Grant plays the kind of the, the town, you know, heartthrob, right? He's the ladies' man. He happens to be at a kind of like a, a function. And there's this uh, attractive woman riding a horse. He takes a look at it and realizes that he actually met her on a train. It's amazing how many Hitchcock stories start on a train, right? Or have something happens on a train. He loves trains. So he actually met her briefly on a train like a week or so before. So anyway, he makes a play for her and it turns out that she is actually uh, from a pretty wealthy family. She's kind of like a um, very uh, not well, she's not a woman who, you know, has dated a lot. She's well, not unmarried, all that sort of thing. Um, we obviously know what kind of, what kind of woman she probably was. Right. So Carrie's like, Oh, this is, you know, he's, he's Have all you ever been kissed in a car. Every, yeah, <laughs> <No>. exactly, <yes. laughs> exactly. So, uh, so they meet, they start dating, they wind up getting married. They move into their, you know, Carrie's character sets sets them up in this really expensive place. As it turns out, you start to see that this guy has no money. He doesn't have a job. He's a gambler. He's kind of like a loser uh, right, for the most part, but he's really charming. And, you know, 
you get the impression that he really does love her and just wants to give her the best of everything, even though he can't afford anything, even though he's going to lose whatever he's got at the track, that sort of thing. Um, but she starts to hear certain things. She starts to get kind of paranoid about his actions and whatnot. And the movie starts to take this turn where Hitchcock is trying to convince you, spoiler alert, possibly, uh, that this guy might not be a really good dude. In fact, might he be trying to kill certain people to, you know, get some money out of it, right? So they're trying to convince you that Carrie is this really, really bad dude. But as the movie unfolds, you're like, well, is he or isn't he? Because every time Joan oh. Fontaine's character gets very paranoid about something she thinks he has done, as it turns out, he hasn't. She's misinterpreting it. And it's like, oh, yes, you know, you're the same man I married and loved, whatever. And then the next scene, something else happens. So this whole film, I was like, is he or hair? He? What's that? I was just fixing your hair, not trying to strangle you. <laughs> and there's all these great scenes, right? Yeah, trying to push out of the clips car. and whatnot. I mean, it's just, it's a very like kind of tense film, uh, you know, but in the end, without getting too deep into the ending, uh, if you know anything about Hollywood and Cary Grant, Cary Grant was always labeled as like Hollywood's leading man. Cary Grant can do no wrong. So they tried very hard in this film to put him against type, or did they? I'll leave you with that because I think you really need to see this film. Uh, he is amazing in it because again, he's suave and debonair one minute, the next you can see that he's a guy who's probably deep down inside. He's got a lot of issues, but he yeah. really loves her. And she is just so, she's very naive about everything in the world. Um, but I think uh, Nigel Bruce is terrific in this film. Of course, many of you might remember him from the old Sherlock Holmes films. He played Watson. He is so perfectly cast as yeah. Harry's, old buddy um but yeah really really good film enjoyable good psychological thriller um but again it's kind of like is he or isn't he that's the whole film right so he's the kind of guy you want to hang out with but you don't want in the family ex yeah. exactly yes <laughs> the kind of guy you can get away from it's, yeah, it's you in a month or so yeah it's, re it's refreshing to see nigel bruce in a non because he doesn't really play it he just plays a good friend of Cary grant's he's not the dim bulb you know Watson, who we all love, but right, it's great right. to see him. And I, I love watching Nigel was in any role outside of outside of Sherlock Holmes. It's funny you were mentioning about how Cary Grant at that point, you know, he had been known for doing things like, you know, bringing up Baby and Gunga Din. And in reality, it wasn't until he went to RKO Pictures, where Suspicion was done at, that he started taking on more serious and darker roles, as in a film called Mr. Lucky. Where he played a gambler. Uh, he's also in uh, None But the Lonely Heart, which he plays like kind of a loser cockney guy, which went back to his roots. But the funny thing about it is, as they were making the film at RKO, um, Cary Grant was such a quote, good guy, you know, always this bubbly, friendly guy. Now, I'd love to say the original ending of, I'm not going to say what the ending happens in the film. But may I say, you're going to hold up the spoiler thing? The oh. original the original ending intended... Give him a second, Dan. Give him a second. They're fumbling okay. the mute. All right. Here we go. The original ending intended was that Joan Fontaine's character believed that he wanted to kill her. And as you see, she thinks he's going to kill her. And the scene where he brings her the glass of milk, okay, uh, suspicious as it is... Uh, what happens is that she, she's writing a letter to her mother saying, if anything happens to me, I believe that so-and-so is trying to murder me. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny is murdering me. And the last scene of the film was he gives her the milk, which is poisoned. And the last scene is him walking out of the house and dropping the letter of accusation into the mailbox. So he's going to be caught. But... RKO said, look, Cary Grant is, too, we cannot, yeah, he's a good guy. We can't do this. Just like having sex, your foot can't leave the floor, whatever it is, you know, but it was so, it was kind of wild. They didn't want to taint his reputation at that point. But suspicion, once again, there, did you, I, I went to the nature cold, so I had to leave. Uh, you mentioned the, the glass of milk scene. No, no, like I didn't want to, I, I tried not to give too, too okay. much. Too much. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, there's one there's one scene where there's a glass of milk and 
it's kind of why why is the glass of milk glowing they put a light bulb a light in bulb it. in it yeah oh. like, but it's very sinister and he's walking through a spider web it's just the the, the whole visual is a hitchcock does that's what i'm saying you can have a film that can be mediocre and then all of a sudden there's like one or two segments that just go wow yeah you know as you look and analyze it and, for everyone uh, for everyone watching uh if you happen to whether you own or don't own or you're considering owning some of these films on dvd or blu-ray or whatever almost all of them have very cool special features and documentaries oh. that talk about all these interesting technical things that hitchcock did with cameras and props I mean, unbelievable what he used to get these amazing visual effects. Um, and, and Dan just talked about one of them because I, I was actually just watching that and, documentary. The and other before day. and before the documentaries came on DVDs, how I learned about all these nuances aside from seeing the film many years ago was that there was one documentary that came out. And it's actually on YouTube, I believe. Or it's actually, I take that back. It might be on streaming, but it is just something like Hitchcock, the films of Hitchcock. And they, this very rudimentary documentary they did probably in the 19, early 80s, in which they noted a bunch of these different nuances, which got me totally into him. You know, and it makes you observe his films, but nonetheless. Yeah. And for those of you who still read books, uh, there are plenty of, of books out there that also talk about all these oh, yeah. techniques that he used. So anyway, back to Jamie. All right. You want to be, we need, you want me to start talking faster? I'm, we're only on number nine. Just I know, going. right? Yeah, we got a long ways to go. Oof. Maybe I have to break this into two parts to be continued. This might this may turn into a trilogy, like you know, like the Spookies thing. <laughs> While I'm on a strangers on a train. Yeah. So, some crazy guy, possibly a, a, an older relative to Jim Carrey's Cable Guy, because they they are very very similar. Uh, meets a tennis player on a, on a train and they want to exchange numbers. Uh, you, my dad, I'll murder your wife. So crisscross. There's a lot of crisscrossing going on in this movie. Um, you have the two people crossing paths. They call each other double crossers a few times. They want to crisscross the murders. And I got pictures for this one. It opens with that crossing of the tracks. Crossing of the legs. On the lighter, there's crossing of the tennis rackets. And of course, crosses in the back on the bookshelves and in the back by the steps. And there's plaid shirts with the crisscross etching and designs. So it's everywhere in the movie. Hitch never did anything by mistake. So let me get my pointer. But Hitch makes you afraid of a certain something in this movie. Even if it's in one little scene. Uh, there's a famous movie where he might have made you uh, afraid to take a shower. In this one, it kind of makes you afraid of yourself a little bit. That is a mirror, <laughs> an image of me saying, who, me? <laughs> yes, you, Laszlo, you. And why does he make you afraid of yourself? Well, this asshole, Bruno, actually asks a woman at a party, are you telling me you never, you never wanted to kill anyone? You never found anyone such a nuisance that you wished them dead? And she laughs and says, no. And the viewer laughs and says, no. And then the viewer goes, well, there, well, let me think. <laughs> and you start thinking and you start questioning your own morality just for a moment so instead of being afraid to take a shower you're kind of afraid to be in your own head and uh that's my deep part of this conversation about this movie my little uh tagline on the bottom is Miriam, the wife of a uh, guy she isn't hot enough to be a c-word she is such a bitch in this movie and you're just not hot enough honey to be the bitch you are <laughs> with her big goofy glasses yeah, which come cool. to play in the plot later in the movie the glasses of course yep yeah that's, that's a great film great film it's a great and movie perhaps one of my favorite climaxes of all hitchcock films oh yeah, yeah. The, the unset the unsung hero of this movie is the old guy who crawls underneath the merry-go-round he's the hero and yeah. he dies. He's got to be dead. Did he die? You never see that. 
I mean, had well, to, I, right? I don't think anyone would, could have survived that in the center, man. I mean, you want, yeah, trust me, his hair is touching the butt. Yep, spoiler. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> mute. You know, um, no, that's, I, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't, let me tell you, those nuances you brought up about the crossing, my God, even in my whatever vast nerdy, it, I never saw that. Me I, either. I'm going to have to go back never, and rewatch it again. I just watched it a couple of Never weeks. thought that. I mean, the only thing I will say with crosses that I will bring up to like kind of redeem myself is that in the film Scarface from 1932, um, Howard Hawks film, anytime somebody is killed, there's a cross above them somewhere. Uh, and, but that's, you know, but this, that was good observation, Jamie. Good observation. Wow. I, I can't take credit for that, man. No, I, I, I did research. Come that's on. all right. But that's, that's okay. But you know what I'm saying? You made it your own, and that's good. I almost took credit. And you also put it. that <laughs> sexy photo of yourself up. So guess what? It is yours, my friend. There you go. Uh, <laughs> am I up? You're up. All right. Well, this is a film that I've had a very, very on and off relationship with for many years. And Jamie, at one point, I know we don't usually share what we're going to put on the show, but I was he, drinking. He gave at me the time. a sense, of, and he sent me a couple of pictures of some of the, uh, the his, his little his cards. You know, uh, his let's make a deal. I'm in the audience. Pick me cards, whatever they are. And he he put this up, and he he put up a couple of films. And I said, well, this is good because some of these are not on my list, so it makes it kind of exciting that we're not going to repeat each other, but. Um, it made me revisit something and I revisit, and that's the film Notorious. And that's my number, what's it, number eight. Hey. And the reason why I brought Notorious, I've always, for the years, I've always found Notorious very boring. I could never get through it. I know, I know, let me, I oh, redeem myself you. here. I redeem myself, <laughs> I do. But, oh, when I come up, well, let me give you the analogy. You're gonna be very excited about this. Um, you know, I've watched over the years and Yes, there are some amazing scenes. It's one of those films, in my estimation, that you had the film and all of a sudden you had a couple of things that redeemed it fully. And that would be the ending and, of course, um, the wine cellar. And, of course, this was the introduction of the MacGuffin, or at least in a big scheme of things. And I, I watched it. I made this uh, I came to this conclusion that why it is a great film and it's funny because, you know, if anybody, may I explain what a MacGuffin is to the audience? Yes. Or am I taking Explain it to me. Okay. A MacGuffin is something that happens in a film or in a story that seems very, very important. Now, it might be mentioned again. It may not be. And it seems to be part of the story. But it, it does move the story forward. But that's it. It doesn't, you know. And the MacGuffin in Notorious is when they're when Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman are in the wine cellar together. Um, they break a bottle of wine, and in the bottle of wine, it appears to be sand. So Cary Grant, they're both agents. I mean, no, they scoop up the sand. He puts it in his pocket. That's it. And it's you find out later in passing that the sand, I don't know, spoiler. The sand is of a uranium, it's uranium or uranium. There's radioactive uh, matter in it. And the thing about it is that they mention it passing and that's it. But the how the MacGuffin, that's the MacGuffin, but how that act that they did moves the story forward is by breaking the bottle when Claude Rains, who goes down to the, to the uh, wine cellar, he, they didn't tidy up as much as they thought they would. And he finds clues that somebody was down there, right? And by the way, this is another six degrees of separation with Monster's Den. Claude Rain should have figured this out because 13 years earlier, he had made himself invisible. So he's a scientist. But that being said, he's the invisible man. But what I found out, what I realized about the film, and it made it great to me, is that in reality, the main gist of the story in Notorious is the relationship or the setting up of, of, of a Cary Grant uh, hiring or bringing into the CIA or secret operative fold Ingrid Bergman as a operative or a spy operative and the guilt he goes through, basically whoring her out. 
turning into you know this, and and the end, whatever he does to eradicate or fix the situation, that's the main story. The MacGuffin are the Nazis. They really are. The whole story is based on their relationship or his angst as he goes through. So that's why I love this film because the whole film is a MacGuffin yeah. in the scheme of things. So that's why I love the film. I, I kind of pulled it back into my orbit. I was not, I, it had been off the, off the list, on the list, off the list. Years ago, I couldn't stand it, this and that. And I came and I said, wow, this is just a well-crafted and incredible story. It is. I, at its core, it's a love triangle is what it oh, is. In a very and the, end of, the, one, the right? end of the story is that it's one of those endings. If you notice some Hitchcock films, there's not a happy ending. It just ends. You know, like a happy ending. Yes. Uh, North by Northwest. I mean, um, nor, you know, wherever he grabs her hand, they wake up on the, the train and whatever. They, they have sex. That's wonderful. That's how it ends. But, you know, this film ends, but you know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen to them. And that happens to a lot of Hitchcock films. You know what's going to happen to the, the main characters. But something happens, you know, as when somebody's going to get their comeuppance, which was what, Claude Rains. And that ending sequence, spoiler, spoiler. Ah! Ah! when he walks up the steps you know he's fucked excuse my french he's fucked and but that's why it makes it a great film and thank you for jamie for saying it's your favorite film can maybe revisit it and say maybe i'm not as intuitive as i thought i didn't say it's my favorite <laughs> what i did not say that oh no but you had it in your list i'm sorry yeah. i'm sorry right, right. i'm giving another spoiler but no nonetheless yeah. no notorious your own spoiler sign sir huh Get your own spoiler sign. <laughs> I, I may have to. I may have to start making signs and like I have something to show you during cycle that'll make you very excited, but that's okay. okay. There you go. Well, I think we'll Next. be talking, I'll be talking about notorious in a little bit. So uh hold on to your hats, everybody. All right. So my number eight, uh, I love Jamie's shirt, and uh, that is my next choice from 1948. We got rope. All right. Uh, I don't know if people can see. This is my big Hitchcock box set here, Blu-ray box set. Um, fascinating film from 1948 starring Jimmy Stewart, James Stewart, whatever you want to call him, uh, Farley Granger, John Dahl, Joan Chandler. This is another one of those really interesting films that's basically all shot in one little setting. Again, it's in this apartment, right? You can see the, the fake background of what New York City uh, through the window of the dining room or living room, whatever the hell it is. But basically it's these two young bachelor guys, which again, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, you kind of get the impression throughout this film that they are like, you know, a gay couple. Right. They don't actually come out and say it. They don't really actually act like it, but they're living together. They talk about going on vacation together. They're kind of weird with each other about certain things. But anyway, uh, they're like very they're intellectuals uh, and they're they're just what just out of college a few years. Right. Um, and they're throwing a party for a very close friend of theirs who they went to school with and all of their other friends. But they've got this thing where they're like. They want to know what it would be like to kill someone. So they invite their buddy over whose birthday it is, who's the one they're throwing the party for. And before the party, they strangle him. That's how the movie starts, oh. them strangling him. Okay. And uh, then they take his body, they put it in a chest. The chest is in the apartment with a cover over it. That's where they're going to put all the food and everything like that. And people start arriving to the party, including Jimmy Stewart, who was their old like um, headmaster or something like that, or a dorm master, something like that at school. He's um, a little messed up himself. Yes, he is. He's very odd. Yeah, he's very odd. And uh, but they start, you know, Farley Granger's character starts to is starting to stress out, thinking that they're going to get busted with this with their buddy's dead body in the uh, the, the chest right in the room where everybody is eating and drinking, right? So the guy's girlfriend shows up, all the other friends show up. Where is he? Why is he not here? The guy's parents show up, right? Why is our son so late? This is not like him. So the whole film is these two guys who now are, are really like upset with each other because Farley Granger's character is like, why do we do this? I can't take this. We're going to get caught. The other one's like, oh, it's okay. You know, we, we're going to be fine. No one's going to know. And 
Jimmy Stewart's character, who's very like keen on watching what's going on at all times, starts to see the kind of the, the chink in the armor, so to speak, right? And he's like, something is going on here. These two guys are up to something, right? And then as people start leaving the party because it's not a party because the guest of honor ain't there, Jimmy Stewart's character leaves and comes back and he confronts the two guys. I'm not going to stay anymore, but the whole rest of the film is watching these two guys, this, these two friends or the couple, whatever you want to call them, starting to crumble, right? How long can they keep this whole gig going, right? So it's, it's a fascinating film. Again, you know, some people aren't crazy about this film because it's just kind of like all in one scene, the entire film. And it's a very talky, you know, a lot of talking, a lot of dialogue in it, but I think it's just fascinating. And I, I love how Jimmy Stewart's character is trying to peel back the onion layers right throughout this whole film, which I think is great. And he does a masterful job. Uh, and they also hitch, we talk about uh, like technical camera techniques a good batch of this film is all shot in like one take. So he would be one camera take, the camera would move all around the place. I think the whole film only has like a handful of, of like stops mm -hmm. and then where they, they restart, but uh, pretty fascinating. The camera's just following these actors all over the place. As they move into a different room, follows them there. It's just, it's really weird. Some people don't like that whole thing. I think Jimmy Stewart went on record saying for him, this film didn't work, uh, but I think it's a wonderful film and I, lo I love it. So that's my number eight. No, it played, it played right. off. It played off like a stage play. Yeah, exactly, it yeah. was, and it was it was a series of like ten or twelve minute cuts, like yeah. four scenes. It was also based on a famous true story of called Leopold and Logue, who were two rich, preppy type of guys that wondered about murder and wanted to. They killed a young boy, and it had been it was a very heinous crime in the late twenties and very sensationalized. It was actually made in 1959 as a film with Orson Welles as their lawyer and Dean Stockwell, uh, who appeared eventually in what was that film, Quantum Leap, and things like this um, about that. But it's yeah, it's but it was yeah, it was it was filmed like a stage play. I think that's why that's why uh, Stewart was not thrilled with it because it was a very long take, and Jimmy Stewart was not really a stage actor. Henry Fonda was. Jimmy Stewart was not. Yep. So, yep. But a good film nonetheless. Yeah. Never. And it was independently produced by Hitchcock in his own company called Transatlantic. Uh, he produced like two films under his own film company. And it, unfortunately, it kind of bombed. But, you know, hey, it Appreciate happened. It. Now, now, it's viewed, now it's viewed much more, you know, favorable. It's kind of like, you know, all of a sudden now Berlin by Lou Reed is viewed as this masterpiece. And Lou Reed's answer to that was, why didn't they say that to me back in 1972? Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you know. Better late than never, I always say. Better late than ever. That's it. What do you got next, Jamie? Oh, I forget. Let's find out. Ah, Rebecca. Uh -huh. Ah. <laughs> so. The last one that I watched during this whole exercise. <laughs> All right. So we got uh, Lawrence Olivier. He's a douchey aristocrat who loses his perfect wife and remarries. And the new chick tries to uh, fill the shoes of the perfect wife. The lovely Joan Fontaine. Yep. Yes. Hitch always found the hottest chicks. Oh, yeah. Normally blonde, too. Um, so what effing genre is this movie? <laughs> Psychological horror, love story, thriller, courtroom drama, ghost story, gothic horror. It's a little bit of all of it. Yeah. It, 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 and it works. It goes into one thing into the next and you don't even feel like the shift. Uh, so I got it. That was the first one. The next one is, was it common in 1940 to Cousin Bang? Because in this movie... We got some cousin banging going on in this movie. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and everybody's shocked that, you know, Rebecca is not in this movie at all because she's dead. And we found out that Rebecca was banging her cousin. And everybody's shocked that she was having an affair. What? She was having an affair? Yeah, and it was her cousin. She was having an affair? So I got to wonder... Was it common in 1940 cousin bang? Because not only was she banging her, not only was she banging her cousin, 
but she was having a kid with her cousin. And not only was she having a kid with her cousin, but her cousin was Shere Khan from the Jungle Book. <laughs> well, it was the voice actor. <laughs> Just the, and I, I was watching the movie and I was like, this dude sounds familiar. And I did some Googling. Like, well, incest, oh, incest, creates, incest creates tigers with bad attitudes. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. He's such a sleazy actor, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> So my next question is, is Judith Anderson a vampire? Because look at this broad. <laughs> she looks like Bella Lugosi's twin sister. It does. <laughs> and like look the at her there, Dracula, yeah. going for the neck. Well, you know, they've hinted, they, really they've hinted for the neck. <laughs> they've hinted this that it was like kind of a very deep, lesbian, you know, there was a lesbian obsession there. Yes. Yeah. You know, and trust me, lesbianism was not out of question with Hitchcock's films. He always trudged into that, trudged into that. Yeah. Well, she, not, she might not be a vampire, but this would be hard to see. She was a Vulcan in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. That is true. Spock's mother. So we had Star Trek before, now we have her as a Vulcan, and then we have Khan. You see how it all works with Star Trek? Now I can see why you spent a month on this. I oh, really God, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I'm, I feel exhausted. Maybe we should do two parts. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Let's get serious, though, because there is a scene in here that I noticed where they describe a murder like they do in Rope. It was almost like it was practice in Rebecca for Hitchcock because they describe the murder and they say, this happened there, and the camera focuses there. And then she went there and it focuses there. And then they bumped their head there and it focused. You don't see the murder, but you're imagining the bodies in the empty spaces. It only happens for maybe 20 seconds, but the version in Rope is a lot longer. Like I'm gonna do what I did in Rebecca and extend it. So he, he I think he recycled ideas quite a bit. Well, he, he built upon them. He like pushed the envelope even more as much as he could, you know. By the seventies, he was in his glory. But you now it's funny. One one last thing about Judith Anderson, and uh, this is going to be an analogy to uh, Abbott and Costello, a film they made in nineteen forty six called "The Time of Their Lives," in which takes place at their ghosts from the Revolutionary War. And anyhow, at one point in the film. There's this abandoned, there's this mansion that is now a museum that belongs to this old family in Revolutionary War. And the housekeeper is played by Gail Sondergaard, who played also in, uh, uh, what's that, the uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman, Return to the Spider Woman Universal in the 40s. But anyhow, somebody walks in when she answers the door, the comic relief woman in the film looks at her and goes, didn't I see you in Rebecca? playing this dour vampire-ish type woman but yeah she's right. so good in the role though man you just oh, every time oh, she, she walks is. into the room you're like oh god there she is again yeah hey the way she the way in rebecca the way she's showing like these are her clothes and she's going through the whole thing and that's why that's why i was kind of like wow there's something creepy going well it wasn't like it was a it wasn't a lesbian relationship that went both ways but obviously the housekeeper was obsessed with rebecca yeah so very cool. Good choice. All right, Dan, back to you. Mine's going to be simple. We've talked about this already. Strangers on the train. And um, Jamie kind of hit it. And I'll just hit a couple of points with this as we move along. And one, I would like to say that um, Bruno, played by Robert Walker, makes Uncle Charlie in Shadow of a Doubt seem like a kid's show host. I mean, he's a psycho beyond psychotic. Um at the point where, you know, when he's obsessed to murder somebody, and there's this one scene, if you notice, when he's in the, uh, the carnival, where this kid comes by, and he has a cigarette, and he pops the kid's balloon. I mean, just, and then, after he murders somebody, he helps a blind guy across the street. Yeah. <laughs> because he has, he has morals, he has ethics. And the sad thing about uh, Strangers on the Train is that, you know, Robert Walker, who had a very tragic life, he died like two months after it was released. He had a very tragic life of alcoholism and mental problems and so forth and so on. 
but this was his this was his shining hour and why he was not nominated for an academy award it goes beyond the scope of thought he is so marvelous as this psychotic rich kid villain and that being said then again hitchcock never won an academy so but this anyhow, one best picture though what's that this one best picture it did. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But he but he didn't win as the director. He did not win. The, the, the best picture goes to the producer, which was Selznick. Uh, but anyhow, but the thing is, Robert Walker's incredible in it. Uh, everybody's great. Uh, Hitchcock aided, hated Ruth Roman in the role. She was put into the cast because she was under contract. Uh, was not happy with her. Uh, but it's, you know, but Stranger on Train, great film. The first film, just in a trivia sense, it was one of the first films that came out when the DVD revolution came around. DVDs were coming out. Nowadays, when you get it, either on Blu-ray or on DVD, there are two separate DVDs. But this came in the early days. It was the first film that came out that had the both cuts on one side and the other. So it was one of the th first uh, releases that gave you like a alternate cut or some special effects or special uh, edition type of thing. But that's it. Great film. I will say no more. Jamie, Jamie hit it. So we move on. All right, my number seven, uh, 1954's Rear Window. All right, Jimmy Stewart, Grace Kelly, Raymond Burr, Wendell Corey, Thelma Ritter. Um, probably, arguably, one of his most beloved and famous films. He's got a couple of them that usually are a choice for most people. Um, you know, most people have seen this. I'm not going to go too in depth in the story, but it's all about, uh, you know, this photographer, Jimmy Stewart, who's recuperating from a broken leg. He lives in like this apartment complex. So he's spending all this time in his apartment, looking out his window, because of course he's got nothing better to do. And uh, he starts to see some strange things going on across the courtyard with one of his neighbors, who's played, of course, by uh, Raymond Burr. He's got his girlfriend, Grace Kelly, who pops in and out all the time. So he, uh, he starts to really watch what's going on. And he suspects that, uh, you know, Raymond Burr might have killed someone. All right, because he's walking around with this, you know, the dog disappears, all this kind of stuff is going on. So this whole film is him obsessing. And I think that's what it's all about is him obsessing about what's going on across the way. Did his neighbor do this? That's the question. That's the plot. I'm not going to give any more away. It's a fantastic film. So well acted. Uh, once again, you got this, you know, the absolutely lovely uh, Grace Kelly, who looks amazing in this film. But this is all about Jimmy Stewart's character for me. And um, an absolute classic. Could have ranked higher for me, but he's got so many good ones. So I'm going to leave. Almost it. made my list, but I figured you guys would pick it. So I wanted to mix things up. Yeah, there you go. All so right, do you want to break this up into two parts or you want to tell Lynn and Abba to hold off? Yeah, I might tell her we're gonna run a little late. So let's keep going. Okay. All right. Are you doing are you doing are you doing a top 10 nickelback tonight? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's your con and there you uh, go. There he goes. Number six. North by northwest. So an everyday man is mistaken to be a government agent who doesn't even exist. Uh, is it the funniest Hitch movie? It's debatable. I think up to this point, 1959, it is the funniest Hitch movie. I mean, the drunken scene where uh, Cary Grant is in the um, police station drunk as hell is laugh out loud funny. I think it's Cary Grant's shining moment in any movie that I've ever seen. Uh, and this movie has what other spy films lack. Meaning, when I watch a spy film, I sometimes feel stupid because I don't know what's going on. Everyone in a spy movie is a spy. They know the game, the ins and outs of being a spy. I, as a viewer, has, have to catch up to their level quickly to know what's going on. Sometimes I get lost. I doze off, zone out, and I'm like, what's going on? Here, we have a dummy like me and we learn as he learns. So I have a character to latch onto and I understand everything going on. Another thing is when you're watching this movie and it's 44 minutes in, you might ask yourself, where the hell is the hot blonde? I expect a hot blonde to be in this movie. And he literally runs into her on a train. train. <laughs> no surprise there, right? But here's the thing. Uh, 
Cary Grant is 20 years older than Eva Marie Saint in this movie. But his mother, the actress that plays his mother, is only eight years older. So it would be seen as better almost if he dated his mom in this movie. The actress, I guess. But hey, 20 years younger, high five carry. Yep. <laughs> uh, Mount Rushmore versus driving. What the hell does that mean? It's just a simple question. The Mount Rushmore scene in this movie looks so great and so real. How come still all the driving in these movies looks so damn fake? No. It can make it look like you're falling off the nose of George Washington, but put me in a car and it looks fake as hell. <laughs> and Mason, James Mason, that's basically there because even though this was, what, uh, three years before the first James Bond movie, this has a very James Bond feel to it. Oh, absolutely. Big yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And James Mason plays like a James Bond villain. He's got the henchmen. He's got the big house. He's got the accent. He's got that sly humor. In fact, I, I Googled him and James Bond because I figured there had to be something there. There was kind of something there. He was a contender to be Bond for Dr. No, even though he was in his 50s. Mm. And he sadly turned down the role of Hugo Drax in Moonraker. Wow. Yeah. He would have been a perfect Bond villain. And he would have made Moonraker a better movie. Yeah, like he, would have been great. he would have been great. So there you go. Great Friend film. Quest. On to yep. you. Hey, what's what's the line when he's in the when he's in the when he's in the police station, and he's calling his mother to get the lawyer, mind you, the lawyer Ed Platt from Get Smart, yes, you know, infamous Ed Platt, but he says they've been feeding me bourbon all night. She goes, did they offer you a chaser? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he phone and goes, that was mother, <laughs> no mother. So anyhow, I'm up. Yep. Okay, well, mine's very simple. Uh, lady vanishes, but Jamie covered it all. And I kind of put my two cents in earlier. Um, the only thing I can add to this is that Michael Rennie, if you're watching in the first half of the film, he was a stage actor. He didn't take it too seriously. And then they finally said, look, get with the act. Let's go. And they realized what it was. And he started getting more into the character. So you really can't say much more about um, Lady Vanishes than what Jamie had put in there. Great on a train, somebody disappears. Boom, charters in Caldecott, Caldecott and charters, and uh, yeah, just it's 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 a film. It's a film that actually brought him to America, I believe. That was his last great British film, Jamaica Inn. No, you know, but this is the film that brought him to America, and uh, he took it from there. So there you go. That is my number six. Ooh. The lady vanishes. Well, I'm going to go also with my number six, North by Northwest. There it is. Uh, one of the great adventure films of all time, I think. Uh, and I think a um, man, the uh, the sexual chemistry between Cary Grant and even Marie Saint is pretty, pretty intense. Uh, there's, there's a couple, I mean, that's uh, it's what it's all about. Right. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, Jamie did a great uh, job of talking about it. I, I think the score by uh, Bernard Herman is fabulous in this film. And it's got these great chase scenes and just the whole film just moves at like a breakneck pace. And uh, yeah, again, another one of those examples of, you know, mistaken identity, the wrong guy, right? Titch uses yeah. this concept all throughout his films. But yeah, this is uh, probably for most, you know, I would say out of all of Hitchcock's films, probably the most accessible. Like if you, if someone is not going to dive deep into the films of Hitchcock, you got to at least see North by Northwest because, you know, like you mentioned, Jamie, it's, it plays like a Bond film. It's just, it's an yeah. everybody film. So yeah, that's my number six. And the it's only, actually, the only, oh, I'm sorry. No, the only film. Say, it's actually did. his longest movie. If you yep. don't include uh, the extended DVD uh, Topaz, but, um, and it doesn't feel like his longest movie. No, it moves really quick. Yeah. Yeah. It moves fast. It's the only it's the only film he did with MGM, and it's interesting to show show a precedent about what how Hitchcock was. He was very meticulous in what he did, and what it was it, the film runs about two hours and sixteen minutes, two hours and seventeen minutes. Um, 
MGM wanted to cut the film down to under two hours. And Hitchcock had a clause that he had control over Final Cut. And he put this clause in many films. And that's something that doesn't happen very much, that the director, not the producer, the director has the final cut. And uh, he, he liked total control of his vision. And that you have to applaud him with that. Because generally, I mean, what happened with, and I think he learned that from Norman Lloyd, because Norman Lloyd was friends with Orson Welles. And aside from Orson Welles pissing everybody off with Citizen Kane, Magnificent Ambersons got butchered when, when Hitchcock, when, when uh, Welles was not around. And Hitchcock wanted nothing of this. No, you're, this is my vision, my thing. And he controlled everything from the production early on to the finished product. So that's very interesting because, you know, had he had, had not control or clauses in contract, we would not be talking about North by Northwest as this, we'd be looking for the director's cut or the snips and cuts. Yeah, exactly. I have one question. I brought up the, the extended uh, DVD edition of Topaz. Who watched that movie and said, you know what this movie needs to be? Longer. <laughs> yeah. Topaz. Topaz. Long enough as it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, like, right. I've lightened up a torn curtain, but Topaz is still kind of like a teeth grinder. Don't know what was going through his mind at that point, but number five. Number five is my shirt. Yep. All right, you That's explained me. it. Don't need to explain it, but let me just say, Stewart gets top billing. It takes him thirty minutes to get in the damn movie. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I guess star power, man. You need that name there. Um, in real time, in one apartment, like you said, and there are long takes, but there's one long take I'd like to talk about because it really impressed me. I call them douchebag number one and douchebag number two. Douchebag number one is the one that's glad that they murder him. Douchebag number two is the guy who gets drunk and says, why did we do this? <laughs> so douchebag number one, I didn't get a picture. I was thinking of getting a picture of a douchebag, but I don't even know what they look like. But so he is walking. The, the take has already been going on for like seven minutes. And the camera follows douchebag number one as he walks into the kitchen. All right, so this is, uh, I got the picture. This is douchebag number There you number go. Two, and Farley yeah. Granger is douchebag number two. two. So number one is walking into the kitchen. And the, and the long scene has already been going without a cut for about five, seven minutes. I got to put my pointer down for this. So he walks into the kitchen and it's a swinging door. And the door swings this way. And you see him hiding, holding a rope over a drawer. And then the door swings this way towards you and you see him drop the rope. And it has to happen perfectly. If it doesn't, they go back seven minutes and take do it all again. So I find that very impressive because who knows how many takes that took to do that yeah. perfectly like that. Maybe they got it on the first one. I don't know. We're getting all our shit on the first one. Um, why is there a rainbow here? You may ask. Oh, is it because oh, yeah. douchebag number one and douchebag number two how uh, should I say, might like each other's Hitchcock? I huh. don't know if they do or don't, but that's not why the rainbow's there. <laughs> the rainbow's there for a totally different reason. It is a talkative drama. I tried to get my wife to watch it and she fell asleep. She said too much talking. But it goes into the suspense so gradually that you notice the suspense when it's there, but you don't know exactly when it happened. It's very gradual, like the colors of a rainbow. The purple goes into the blue. You know where the purple is. You know where the blue is. But you're not sure where the purple ends and the blue begins. Kind of like the suspense into the drama. Blends in slowly. And the ending reminds me of Seinfeld episode. With the blinking light. Remember oh, yeah. when uh, Kenny yeah. Rogers' chicken <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was going off by their apartment, keeping them up? There's yeah. a light like that outside their window as it gets darker. Yeah. And it intensifies the suspense. As the suspense grows, the light gets brighter and flashes more. Yep. You know, those, those big windows like Greenwich Village apartments are used in so many films in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, anything from, you know, when you're watching it through Rope or uh, The Fallen Sparrow from 43 or even, you know, they, these Greenwich Village, these huge windows and they're like great New York scenery at that point. Great settings. 
Good stuff. Yeah, he was just pushing the buttons because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in these films and you, you we're going back to like, you know, the 40s and the 50s where, you know, not a lot of other directors would have taken these chances and like, you know, he hints at all these things and it's up to the viewer to decide, well, is, the, is this actually, you know, we're talking about, you know, the possible homosexual relationship here. I mean, you, they didn't, most uh, directors did not go there back in 19, you know, what, uh, what year was this? 48. Well, it, it, was, it was either blatant. Like if you watch something at the original version of the Maltese Falcon, where Peter Laurie's character in the 1931 version, which is uh, starring as in Joel Cairo's part is played by, oh, monster den alert, Dwight Fry, who comes off as totally effeminate. And they even make a remark to it. Like that was now that was pre-code. Yeah. So you can get away with that. But once the code came in in 1933-34, you had to like hide it. And Hitchcock just loved to push that envelope. Yeah. I just loved to like, you know, make the innuendos and you know, just enough to get past the censors. And I think you got a big jolly out of that. I think so too. All right, number five, Dan, what do you got? Foreign Correspondent. To me, not only is it a Hitchcock film, it is a great action story, it's an adventure. There is comedy, courtesy of Robert Benchley, who was a humorist at that point, who actually wrote his own dime. It was one of the few times that um, Hitchcock allowed an actor to improvise his own dialogue because Hitchcock oversaw everything from the script writing to dialogue. And Robert Benchley at this point, not that he's the main star of the film, but he's the comic relief. And he was so good at this that Hitchcock just let him go. Just do it. But anyhow, it's a film about basically a foreign correspondent. The film was, the, the book was originally written many years before. Uh, but by the time they got around to doing it, uh, it would be many years. So they had to update it to the 1940s. And it's about a, um, once again, there's a MacGuffin in there. There's a clause and a big treaty that's being written in Europe like a big summit, but you never hear what the clause is. It's not, it's important, but it's not. Uh, Joel McRae plays an American journalist going over there and he gets himself involved in anything from plane crashes to God, assassinations. I mean, all the Hitchcock nuances are there. I mean, I can't go into the story too much. You have to see it to believe it, but if there's a plane crash, the special effects are incredible. There's a sequence in a old windmills in Holland that takes place in Holland. Um, whereas once again, a man kind of accused possibly, but not an impersonator, a person who's a diplomat without getting, you, you don't want to give too much away about it, but it's incredible. But the great thing about this film, and it's one thing about it, if you ever want to, when I say criterion and certain types of uh, releases on it, if you got, buy the basic release on it, there's a couple documentaries. The Criterion release shows every nuance of the special effects they did. And not to give too much away, but to give you a spoiler, but it's not. There's a sequence where they pull up with cars, but there's a bunch of windmills with their, their turning in the wind. And as the car pulls up, it is nothing more than a painting in a backdrop of three windmills with motorized windmill movement you don't realize this it's just it's an amazing uh, at that time without special effects without cgi but nonetheless it's a great story and it's gripping and the ending of the story was actually tacked on because it was started at a time before the invasion before the war really took root and by the time the film was getting ready to be released the war had taken root and they had to come up with you know they had to add something to it and the speech that somebody gives is kind of, you know, it doesn't really narrow into things. You know, I like to refer to foreign correspondent is that Hitchcock was very much involved with the war effort as in his family was in England and when war was declared. So I like to refer to a uh, foreign correspondent as the first film in the Hitchcock quadrilogy of war films. And one is starting with foreign correspondent which takes place as the war breaks out. Two is saboteur which takes place on American soil where people are basically blowing shit up around us. Three, lifeboat, where they're on a lifeboat, but in the story, the allies are starting to take a little bit of a upper hand, even though there's losses. And then finally, the last part of the quadrilogy is notorious because that is basically Nazi 
occupation of South America after the war. So I refer to that as his quadrilogy, as his vision of World War II. But anyhow, nonetheless, foreign correspondent, if you are going to watch it, it is worth the price of admission on the Criterion just for the documentaries alone. There you go. Criterion does a great job. They always yeah. do. And now for something completely different for number five, 1963's The Birds. Probably the most unique film he ever did. Um, animals attack, right? For no reason. <laughs> One of those films where, you know, you get the all, the all these birds attacking, you know, the town of towns of Sebastopol, Santa Rosa, Bodega Bay out in California. That's actually where my the company that I work for, my day job, that's where that's where they're from. So I know the area. Bodega, quite Bodega well. Bay exists. Yeah, Bodega Bay. Exists. Wow. Yeah, no it, kidding. It exists, Look yeah. at that. But it's just it's weird to like watch the birds and to see like see you know places in that area that I have been to many times you know for work and think wow it doesn't look like that anymore but uh, you know it's again very simple story just everything seems to be uh, nice and peaceful in these you know uh, Southern California towns and all of a sudden the birds start going batshit crazy and attacking people for no reason. Uh, great cast, uh, Rod Taylor, Tippi Hedren, the lovely Tippi Hedren, who there's a lot of backstory about her weird relationship with Hitchcock, who became kind of obsessed with her, uh, Jessica Tandy, Susanna Plachette. Um, I'm sure most folks have seen it. Really cool special effects, kind of, you know, again, you, you watch the film now, and especially when you're watching in HD, you can see how at the time it was probably looked at as pretty groundbreaking. It's pretty crude by today's standards. Uh, a lot of the, the bird noises are kind of don't sound like birds at times, but when you look at what he had to work with and how he made it work, I mean, there's just some amazing scenes in there. Uh, the special effects for the time, pretty groundbreaking. And it, it's a, just a really just dark, bleak film. And then, you know, without giving too much away from the end, spoiler alert, you get to the end of the film and you're like, all right, why did all this happen? We don't know. They never explained anything. So, but uh, but a, a great film, a chilling film, and uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. I've I've probably seen that film more than any other Alfred Hitchcock movie ever. It's just it's one of those yearly watches. You know, you watch it every year just just because, and it's always fun. So that's my number five. I love the second half. That first half for me is brutal. When I when I was when I was, when I was, when I was a kid, I just don't like it. <laughs> When I, when I was a kid, I remember the scene where they go out to the farmer's house that they knew. I think Jessica Tandy goes out. And he's sitting in the, he's dead in the corner of his bedroom with his eyes poked out. As a kid, I used to always cover my eyes with that because I thought it was creepy as hell. Yeah. yeah. But, that, but, that, but that film between Psycho and The Birds, that was Marnie's Curse. <laughs> I'll explain that later. There's a small little thing, a short little thing, little thing I want to do at the end of the show to explain Hitchcock, 1980s forward. Go ahead. All right, Jamie. Yeah, a lot of his movies it starts off as one type of thing and then goes into a total different type of thing. Yeah, yeah. But the characters in that movie, I just don't latch on to them. I don't care about them enough to enjoy the first half of that movie. All right, I don't even know what's number four. Oh, it's Notorious. Ah, uh, yes. So we've talked about Notorious. Someone already picked Notorious, right, Dan? I did. Yes, yes. So, want to talk about that weird ass kiss? Creepy weird ass kiss. Um, so here's the thing: at the time, you could not kiss longer than three seconds on film. So what Hitchcock did is he had them kiss nonstop, no longer than three seconds, for two minutes and forty five seconds. It starts on the balcony, and they walk into the apartment or hotel room together. He's checking his messages on the phone and they can take it's creepy at the same time you can't take your eyes off it and i also read that the two actors and actresses uh, ingrid bergman and carrie grant they hated the scene they said it felt unnatural and it looks unnatural but i do like that he got around the red tape you know of having a long kiss i do like that want to talk about um grant constantly getting kicked in the heart every time she kicks him in the heart. You feel it. You feel it in your own heart. You feel bad for the guy. It's all and over the space. It's all over. Yeah, I mean, because we've all been there too. And it's like, ooh. And she tells him there's a scene. I forget if it's a park bench or at the racetrack. She says, 
you can add Sebastian's name to my list of playthings, where she's kind of cushioning the blow for him. Yeah. And she's also kind of cushioning the blow for the censors and saying, yeah, I fucked them. And she doesn't want to say that, but you know, and, and, and it's awful. You but know, you I, I think so she, that she has to say it though. So I know, and the dude is so bad. much older than that's, him. That's the that's the great thing about this film. It's like they both feel bad about the things that they're doing. They're, they're doing together. They're in love with but each the, other. The, but the, yes, the, the question I have, and I and I didn't pick this up on the film when Grant meets her in the beginning at the party. Or drinking and then they are driving she's driving he shows his badge the whole thing was he sent out as an agent to bring her in or was that a was that a kind of a happenstance they met each other was that his he was sent out because of her father because of her past history with her father's past history right. being friends with this guy thank you that's not yeah okay she had a relationship with this guy yeah he fell in yeah. love immediately though so it was like kind of love at first sight for him and then he felt right like so this guy and always he, liked her and yeah. he's a friend of her dad. You got to ask the question, when did you start liking her, sir? <laughs> what age there, buddy? Yeah. Because I'm saying, uh, that's what the, the whole MacGuffin, it's the whole relationship is the major thing. Yeah. yeah. His angst and relationship, that's the, the, the Nazis, of, who cares at this point? You know. <laughs> but you did mention the wine cellar scene. I, that might yes. be my favorite scene. Um, Hitch hits his stride as a director. He focus on objects. He will make an object like a teacup become a character in the movie. I didn't mean to drop the mic. I like there. the drop. I, I like that. I dropped it by mistake. Um, he has weird angles at times, like when she's hung over in the morning and looking at uh, Cary Grant. And they built a crane for one shot, a big humongous crane for the shot that starts upstairs at the party comes downstairs and focuses on the key in her hand yep god knows how much they spent on that one i don't know 17 seconds the key becomes a character and the step scene at the end has big suspense i think any young moron who watched this movie today who's spoiled by whatever they see in today's movies. I think they would be on the edge of their seat at the step scene at the end of this movie. This, this is, a, I feel like watching this movie right now. <laughs> I'm going to watch it again this oh, week. You, I just watched hey. it like a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. when you, just by you putting your flashcard up, Jamie, I was like, I have to watch this again. And I did. And I went, wow, the man is right. You know, there's, you know that, that crane shot is very similar to when he did that film, Young and Innocent that one of his British films where it starts in the back of a ballroom and you're going into the eyes of the killer and this one continuous shot that goes from about a hundred and something feet away straight into about four inches from the killer's eyes. Um, he's a drummer in a band and the same thing. It's just one continuous crane shot that goes in. These are things that make makes Hitchcock so amazing. You know, and that's why there's a lot of directors out there that basically have either copied him or or pay homage to him or whatever. It's because he is he is probably the greatest. He knew how to hold and grasp film. He's probably the greatest. So, and I just want to. I'm looking at the screen and I see weird ass kiss. I just want to say I'm reading everybody's mind out there. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I know what you're about to type. Chris Allo and Rich aren't here one week and they're talking about gay guys and kissing scenes. They will be back next week. Relax. Okay, continue. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, too funny. Too funny. All right, Dan, back to you. Number four. Well, Rear Window. Peter, you hit that on the head. Uh, great thing about Rear Window. It's, he goes into the whole peeping Tom voyeurism thing, which once again, pushing the envelope. Why he's so concerned about looking through his lens of his camera when Grace Kelly is prancing around in an evening gown? I have no idea. Exactly. And he's basically and he's basically playing her off like maybe we should get together. And that's the great thing, not to give away spoiler alert. The great thing about the ending is that after he's broken his other leg, okay, and she's sitting there, and yes, they're going to be together, and maybe they'll consummate something. But she's starting to read Cosmopolitan. 
So it's right back to right back to square zero. But the other thing great about Rear Window is the watching of people's lives around us. And you know, the great thing about Rear Window is that Raymond Burr made his early career in Hollywood out of playing the most biggest scumbags and killers and gangsters and the worst. And he redeemed himself by becoming Perry Mason. But he started out as basically a bad guy. I mean, if you want to see Raymond Burr at his worst, you have to watch a film from 1948 called Raw Deal, in which there's this con, this guy that got railroaded to prison, came out and he's going to go after Raymond Burr. And Raymond Burr is such a shit heel. So, but he made his career starting as a shit heel and then ended up being, you know, everybody's favorite lawyer. So, but Rear Window, without a doubt, I saw that in the theaters when they really re released in the 80s and I was awed by it. Grace and, Kelly is uh, so hot in that movie. Oh, right? yes. When she first and appeared, and not she to comes in like a ghost. Not, not, not to take anything away, but to give, give another family cred. Uh, my father-in-law, my father-in-law was friends with Grace Kelly. He was a photographer in Hollywood. And actually, uh, my mother-in-law's best friend, a woman named Rita Gam, who was Grace Kelly's one of her maid of honors in her wedding at Two Win. And this is a photograph that he took of Grace there. Wow. Uh, it's, this picture does not do it much justice, but she's kind of surrounded by vases of roses. And uh, he, he always said in many years, there's only two amazingly beautiful women he photographed. One was naturally beautiful, was Bridget Bardot, and the other one was Grace Kelly. So, so he got stuck in the friend zone with Grace Kelly? Friend zone, yes, yes. He may he may have tapped around. That's a beautiful thing. One, one thing my father-in-law told me. I know he was, wanted to tap around. The great, the great thing, the great thing about he says the best way to pick up women, he was a photographer. He was married, and he came from a world of Hollywood where, you know, uh you knew where your hat was hung. Let's put it to you that way. And you went home. But he said, if you're a photographer, if you make a woman feel beautiful, she's putty in your hands. So we take it from there. Um, but that was the old school. But nonetheless, anyhow, there you go. Cool. Had to had to bring in the family connection somewhere, whether it be Torhan Bay or wherever. So there you go. And speaking of Raymond Burr, they should have kept him out of the original Godzilla. Just saying. God. Yeah. yeah. God. Well, that was a for another day. Yeah. Uh, my number four perhaps the most famous Hitchcock film, uh, 1960s Psycho. Wow, I thought that'd be your number one. Nope. Anthony Perkins, Vera Miles, Janet Lee, Martin Balsam, great great cast. We know the story, the Bates Motel, Norman Bates and his mother, all that kind of stuff. Uh, just a really cool, I guess, kind of slasher-ish film before there was slasher films, right? It's kind of the granddaddy of all of them. Just really good, weird, suspenseful, you know, thriller and uh, everything about it is just uh oozes coolness but at the same time it's like you're almost repulsed at this character uh, of norman bates right but in the end you almost kind of feel sorry for him i mean that the whole like last like five ten minutes it's just like it's just so creepy um and again if you haven't seen it i'm not going to give any more away but it, it's everybody's seen it yeah, I'm sure everybody's. I'd be very surprised if there's anybody who hasn't seen Psycho. But yeah, he plays just such a great character. Um, he's just he's just so creepy and so weird. And it's just weird how like you know he's runs this motel. He's you never see him. He's they practically have to uh, like when Vera Miles and um, uh, the other actor I forget his name off the top of my head, uh, John Gavin when they when they show up later to to get a room. It's like he he almost has to force give. Norman Bates money to pay for the room, right? It's almost like, how are you keeping this business going, right? You're killing half the people that come in and uh, you don't want to collect any money. It's just re really strange, but that just goes to show you, um, you know, just how really creepy and bizarre this film is. And then of course, you know, he's, he's essentially playing both roles here, that of his mother and himself. It's just uh, really warped and, uh, but in a good way. And that's what makes it so great. So that is my number four. The scene where the scene where mother comes out of the room to kill the investigator. Yep. I watched it not too long ago and it gave me, I jumped. It's, yeah, I, jumped. Yeah, I, I agree. Comes that, out of that's, that's, that's that scene with Martin Balsam when he's yeah. walking. That film built such suspense. Now, speaking of which, not to up, not to uh, over. Well, let me just blend right into it. <laughs> oh, that's you. It's so funny. We're all in this. We're all in the same zone here. Wow. So, but hold on, we all know the movie, so I wanted to focus on other things. 
talk about the don't be late thing that Hitchcock did. He put this in the window. This is worth showing up close. He would put this in the window at all the movie theaters and he had a big cardboard. Uh, um, I thought you were saying, hurry up, Pete. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just saying, I'm, I'm just uh, big cord it. cardboard standout saying, don't be late to this movie. Because I guess people showed up really late to movies back then. And they would show up like 45 minutes late sometimes. And he knew people would go in and say, where's Janet Lee? I thought she was in this movie. So be on time. And I wanted to mention how Marion Crane gets netted in this movie. Ned Stark from Game of Thrones. <laughs> we thought he was, what is he? Sean Bean is the actor? Sean Bean. thought he yeah. would be the star of the show. Episode one, he gets beheaded. And we're all like, what? And oh. same thing happened back then in the middle of the movie. Everyone was like, oh, Janet Lee, Janet Lee, she's the star. Stabbed. That was, un, that, was un, that was unprecedented at that time. Yes, it still kind of is. I think this moment here kind of made it more normal. Now we watch shows and we're like, who knows what's going to happen? This kind of said, this was the first, this kind of made it the norm. But let's, in short, let me just say in short. Ned lost his head. Crane went down the... <laughs> Very simple. It sounds like a song. I want to also talk about real quick, 7852. It's a documentary came out in 2017. Um, it, it's all shower scene and that's it for an hour and a half of documentary people talk about. It. It's 78 shots and 52 cuts. And they really get deep into things. Like they're talking about when uh, uh, Marion Crane is driving and it's raining. That's like a prelude to the shower scene and the windshield wipers are like the knife cutting through the water. Are they right? I, I, I don't know. Hitch never did anything on accident, right? Yeah, true. Uh, the psychologist at the end, I noticed, basically describes Psycho 4. And Psycho 4 is the second best Psycho movie ever made, even though it was made for Showtime or HBO back in 1990. I love it. it, it, it it's um, well done. Well Anthony done. Perkins, yeah. Um, He's on the phone talking to a uh, call-in radio show, talking about his childhood, and they do flashbacks to his childhood. His mother is well done. The death scene of his mother is shocking. It's 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 gross. It's it's great. It's very underrated. So you can skip two and three if you ask me, and just go right to four. Cool. My turn. Yes. Oh, gee, what a shocker. Psycho. <laughs> now, just for the record, I know that Jamie walked into the profile, but I, I brought Mother to the show uh, tonight, uh, uh, which, oddly enough, uh, is a uh, go away, Mother. It's okay. Um, yeah, it's actually, a, it's actually a Norman Bates costume I had at the restaurant and a Don Post mother figure that I call mother and, and it's, it's a double XL but don't ask about why it's double XL um, I thought about wearing it tonight but the wig was no good anymore and I figured I don't want people to think that you know Sea of Tranquility or Monsters and brings out the cross dresser in me uh, that's more for Monty Python but anyhow no Psycho is one of these films that is just um, cut wise filming wise he hit he hits all the cylinders and he also pushes the envelope because he is dealing with incest. He is dealing with stuff like this. And the scene, as Jamie said earlier, where, you know, the investigator, as in Martin Balsam, is walking through the house. To this day, it still invokes such suspense that even as, as jaded as you are seeing this film, when he gets to the top of the steps and, quote, mother runs out of the room, you're going like, holy fuck. It's you're a jump scare. Now, interesting, interesting bit of tri trivia about Psycho is that, as you know, in the film Psycho, um, there's a scene, she's in the shower, and you see the silhouette come in front of the shower curtain for a brief moment. Now, we're going to go back to a show that Peter and I did a while ago, which was the non-universal horrors. And one of the films I, rec I mentioned was a film by Val Luton called The Seventh Victim. 
in which um, it's about devil worshipers in Manhattan and Greenwich Village in the 1940s. Well, there is a scene in the film where the hero or the heroine, should I say, Kim Hunter is in the shower. And all of a sudden a silhouette appears in front of the shower curtain, a woman, to tell her to behave herself or threatens her not to go any further what she's doing. And then she leaves. And it's very tense, this is 1943. Well, the interesting six degrees of separation with this is that um, Hitchcock and Val Luton were both under contract and working for David O. Selznick during the time of Rebecca. And Val Luton was actually on contract, I believe, with David O. Selznick during Gone with the Wind. And Selznick, I'm sorry, uh, Val Luton and Hitchcock, you know, became friends, knew each other. And strange thing about it is that Val Luton passed away in 1951. And when the shower sequence, if you watch the seventh victim and you watch the shower sequence as the curtain, as a silhouette comes there, it's almost identical. So people think that everybody, don't get me wrong, as they say, a co copy is the highest form of flattery. Doesn't mean that Hitchcock needed to steal anybody's ideas, but I also wonder if it was a homage to Val Luton because Val Luton was such an incredible director or producer, should I say, in films in the 40s. So that's an interesting analogy with Psycho. But Psycho overall is, is a masterpiece in its own way. Uh, it's one of those films I called, I, I, myself, I call it the Led Zeppelin theory or Stairway to Heaven theory, where you hear Stairway to Heaven so many times you don't want to hear it anymore, as great as it is. Psycho, I've seen Psycho so many times, I was kind of reluctant at one point to put it on the list, just out of sheer, like I've seen it so many times and watched it so many times. But it is just a masterpiece. Yeah, that, you know, Gus Van Zant sat there and fucked it all up in 1998. And as when he I've was doing the remake, that. when he did Shot by Shot and this and that, he, tr he hired Danny Elfman to fill in music because they used some of Bernard Herrmann's uh, score, but he needed to fill in some other music. And he went to Danny Elfman and he said, now, if you know, Danny Elfman was, uh, you know, Tim Burton's go-to guy in soundtracks, as well as a founding member of Oingo Boingo. Don't get me started and, on Oingo Boingo. Oh, yeah. But. The thing is, he sits there, and as Danny Elfman sat there and watched, I guess maybe the rushes or rough cut or the scenes he had to score, he, he looked at Gus Van Zant and he said, you know, you're, you're stepping into a wood chipper, you know this, by doing this. And it uh, didn't really hurt Gus Van Zant, but it didn't gain him any credit. But nonetheless, now there's an interesting, there's an interesting six degrees of separation in the horror world. I'll leave it, I'll ask you guys, you want to answer the question, uh, between Psycho and Halloween, please. What is the six degree? What is the connection between Halloween and Psycho? John Carpenter. Okay. Interesting thing John Gavin's character is named Sam Loomis. The doctor, played by Donald Pleasance in Halloween, is Sam Loomis. Wow, I didn't, wow. Even, I didn't even realize that. Wow. Yeah, and so that was that was that was John. As as I say, uh, Hitchcock um, has affected so many directors, has impacted Guillermo del Toro, who wrote a book in 1990 about him, so forth across the board. That even John Carpenter, I'm going to name a character after Sam Loomis, which is kind of a cool name. That could be like Sam Loomis, crime fighting gynecologist or something, you know, in some weird way, but. Uh, that's the connection between the two. But Psycho, right up there. Cool. My number three, Strangers on a Train from 1951. Yeah, I mean, you guys have talked quite a bit about it. I don't think I need to say too much more. Tennis player meets psychopath on a train. Let's exchange some murders. Yeah, we know how that turned out. So uh, great performance by uh, Farley Granger, I think, in this film. And uh, yeah, Robert Walker so demented perhaps top three demented character in any hitchcock film and uh, the whole like final like 15 minute scene is just got to be seen to be believed so I'm, I'm a huge fan of this love this film that's why it's number three for me so back to jamie all right and you know what's longer than alfred hitchcock's longer longest movie what's that this video. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> no, you know, Peter and I, we did, we did the Universal thing. It was almost two hours. 
Yeah, it was two. It was about two hours. We're, we're going to hit it on this one. We're going to hit it. We're close. All we're right. Close. We'll get it out. My number two is going to be a surprise, and it was it was going to be my number one until Tuesday. Uh -oh. I love this movie. Lifeboat. All right. Yeah. The only DVD I own. There it is. <laughs> limited, limited setting movie. I love limited settings movies. Like uh, we already said, Dow M for Murder and Rope and uh, Rear Window. One's a present day, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Buried, if you ever saw that, where he's in a coffin the whole movie, yeah, Buried crazy. Alive. Yep. Devil, where they're on a um, stuck was... and one person's the devil. Yep. And Frozen, not the Disney musical, but the one where three people are stuck on a uh, ski lift for the whole movie. Yep. I love that shit because you, it, the director has to be really good, and I like to see what he's going to do with this limited area. You, so you, what you, the you viewer, have these kind of movies. What's that? Feel the claustrophobia. That's that's the way. Yes. That works. Yeah. Yes. You need a good director. Check. You need great characters. Check. The one the one woman on this uh, with the, all the uh, the rings and stuff. I forget her name. She might be one of my favorite characters in that. The little bankhead. That's probably her. She was the writer. Yes, yes, the yes. And she yeah, lost her typewriter. Rarely her... made, rarely made films, but yeah. You got to have good chemistry be between the actors and believable friction with the characters when they argue. You got to believe. You got to sometimes see both points, and it kind of reminds me of the mist yeah. when they start arguing with one another. Yep. You got to believe the arguments. And this is kind of like a limited setting movie in a way. They're in a grocery store the whole time. Um, you see the characters in their highs and their lows. And they see each other in their highs and the lows because they're stuck on a boat together the whole movie. But I do have one question about this movie. How did they poop? How did they poop? That's always was a there a bucket involved? It's the million was there a bucket involved? Did they go over the side? Did everybody turn their head while they went over the side? Did everybody watch everyone poop? I don't know. It's a John Steinbeck novel, so maybe he explained it. Well, they, they 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 hung their ass cheeks over the side of the boat and just you know whistled or hung a tongue. You know, whistle while they work. <laughs> and I love the whole thing with the German that they take on. Is he bringing us to safety? Is he not bringing us to safety? That is just magic right there. That's John Steinbeck, I'm sure, right there, coming from the mind of him. What a great combination, huh? Steinbeck and Hitchcock. Yep. Yeah, Stein, Steinbeck wrote the script, but oh, Hitchcock did he? kind of, well, he, wor he worked on a script. And Hitchcock, you know, the funny thing about Hitchcock, Hitchcock always brought in collaborators to do films. And not necessarily use their script, but he would pick their brain and work with them. And he gave them credit, whatever it may be. But yeah, but Hitchcock, I think Steinbeck submitted a script, but it didn't work very well. Um, and Steinbeck was very excited about doing this film because he had been he had been targeted as being like kind of like a red or a communist sympathizer. And this was his way of um, kind of like redeeming himself as a patriot. But nonetheless, he was given credit on, on the screen but he did not write the screenplay. Cool. All Good right, film. Number two. Well, that's Shadow of a Doubt. Uncle Charlie. Uh, let me tell you something. Talk about collaborating with people. I mean, first off, uh, one of the people that contributed the to the uh, script, the script was uh, attributed to three people, which one was his wife, Alma, uh, somebody else, and also Thornton Wilder. Uh, Thornton Wilder was off of this. Um, he was an amazing playwright, and he had a he had a film a play out called Our Town, and Hitchcock was intrigued about this. About here it is an idyllic American town. Evil visits visits an idyllic American town, and the evil is Uncle Charlie. Uh, probably Joseph Cotton's greatest role as playing a character. Uh, he is so debonair. He's so suave. Now, once again, Hitchcock 
touches into this kind of like this weird ancestral relationship with the family because his sister, Uncle Charlie's sister, is very attached to Charlie. And the daughter or his niece, Charlie, who was named after him, is very close to him. And it's always been hinted that he was playing off of this incestual type of relationship. Um, just a great film. I mean, from the comic sense of bringing Hume Cronin in as being like this amateur crime solver and the father, they're so obsessed with murder. And like up, up until Robert Walker attempting to strangle somebody in Strangers on a Train, Uncle Charlie's, di Uncle Charlie's uh, monologue at the dining table talking about women whose husbands work all their lives and they get all their money from their husbands who die and these fat bloated women or whatever he goes on about. And you see him just going into a dark fucking space. Yeah. And you're going like, God, he is just out of his fucking mind. But he's smart. He's lived off of rich widows. Uh, one of the first films done on location, the house that they use for exteriors and some minor interiors still stands, as well as the train station. The town of, San, I think it was Santa Clara. I'm not sure, uh, as evolved, of course, but it was filmed on location. And it was just, other than Saboteur, which was trying to bring his nuances into it, this was the first true Americana film he brought into. Now, this was remade in 1991 by either Lifetime or Hallmark, which is kind of giving you a little indication what's going on here, um, with Mark, ha uh, Mark um, on NCIS, set, NCIS uh, Mark Harmon playing Uncle Charlie. And the best way to describe how films were made when Hitchcock did it and the remakes is to watch the opening five minutes of the credits and watching how the 1991 version opens up. And you go like, why are they doing this? You know, there's such orchestration. Now, Thornton Wilde was, uh, Thornton was, was also given credit on the storyline. He collaborated on the script with him. So he took this great playwright with his Americana script and brought it into this whole thing with evil. And it makes me wonder some days if in fact, although Stephen King likes to give credit to what would happen if Dracula came to a small town, uh, it makes you wonder if he was, in, he was kind of inspired by Hitchcock doing what it happens if evil comes to a small town. Exactly. Now, speaking of which, the film has been remade two other, it was remade in 91, it was remade in 1958 uh, as, sorry, I have to look at a note showing my age. What the hell happened to this? Oh God, hold on, give me a second. Step Down to Terror, which is a remake by Universal. But amongst film buffs and historians, the film The Return of Dracula in 1958 with Francis Lederer follows the same ideology or storyline as Shadow of a Doubt. So that's my useless trivia on this one, but a great film nonetheless. Just, I think it's, this is him finding his full stride even before really getting close to Notorious. So there you go, Shadow of a Doubt. Yeah, great film. I just watched that last week. <laughs> I like that one a lot too, that's good. Uh, just missed out on my top 10. Me too. Number two for me, Vertigo from 1958. Uh, I love this film. Uh, film noir at its very, very best. Uh, Jimmy Stewart makes another appearance here in my top uh, top 10. Kim Novak, looking great in this film. Barbara Belgades, who, who we knew from uh, Dallas for many years, right? Uh, Tom Helmore, Henry Jones. Uh, you know, interesting story of this uh, cop who the, the, the start the film starts over this cool like uh rooftop chase scene right uh jimmy stewart's character and another cop are chasing chasing this bad guy jumping from roof to roof you know the one cop winds up falling jimmy stewart's like hanging by a ledge right he, somehow he manages to uh to survive but of course he's kind of traumatized by this he got kind of injured in the whole thing so uh he winds up kind of hooking up uh, while he's got kind of convalescing. Maybe he's going to retire or whatever, but he's taking some time off from the force. And he winds up hooking up with like an old school chum who uh, says, oh, I, you know, I, I might need some help. I know you're a cop. Maybe you can do some investigative work for me. I think my something's going on with my wife. She's like disappearing a lot. She's going to all these strange places. I want you to follow her and see what she's spending all her 
days doing and all this stuff. And he's like, ah, you know, I don't know if I really want to do that. It's not my thing, but he agrees to do it. And he winds up following her. Of course, Kim Novak is plays the wife and uh, he winds up falling in love with her. And she's doing all these weird things, going to these strange places. She jumps in, into the, uh, into the water at the golden gate bridge and he rescues her. And like I said, they fall in love, all this kind of stuff happens, but then, you know, he sees her die. Did she die? All this kind of stuff. It's And then he's, of course, the whole gist of the thing is he's got vertigo, right? Because of him on the rooftop chase. Now he's afraid of heights. And there's a lot of different scenes where he's up in high places and stuff. And uh, I'm not going to get too much more into the story because that would give a lot away here. But this is this really cool convoluted plot that I think really works. And it's Hitchcock, I think, at his storytelling best. And you really feel the uh, Jimmy Stewart's character who is like so like broken hearted. He fell, quickly fell in love with his friend's wife, right? And then, you know, she dies and he's completely heartbroken. But then someone else appears who looks just like her. Who is she? Where's the friend? All this kind of stuff. I'll leave it at that. It is a must-see Hitchcock film. And no matter how many times I watch it, I think I learn new things from it each and every time. And wonderful. Jimmy Stewart is so good in this role. Um, it just pained, obsessive person that he becomes. And uh, I think Kim Novak also is well, well played in this film. I don't just it's a classic. It's a, you know, almost could have been my number one. There are times where I have called this my favorite Hitchcock film, but Obviously, there's another one that's ahead of it here. So. Who's this gal pal? Medge? Midge? Midge? Madge. 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 That's, that's Barbara Gale Bell Getty. She, 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 yeah. she is so good yes, because is. her sexual, like, ability, like, sexual being is like at a zero. And yes. it's supposed to be a zero. Even her name sounds like, like your buddy from high school, buddy from high school or something. Yeah. And they always joke about how, you know, we, we should have hooked up. We should be together. Yeah. Kind of plays it off. But then as the movie goes on, you get the feeling she wants to be with him. So it's just kind of weird how their whole relationship. That, that gal, that gal Friday type of thing. Very yes. close, but yeah. You know what kills it for me and why it's not on my list? So, so Judy, so Judy looks just like Madeline with the blonde hair and it doesn't, you, you don't go, Hey, you're Madeline. It takes a stupid <laughs> necklace for you to connect the dots. Not her looking and sounding just like her. It takes me right out of it. Well, yeah, but he but he's a trauma, but he's a traumatized individual. So anything is from his perception. And when they threw the real wife off the uh, tower, how come they knew he wouldn't check the body and he would run away? How did they assume? Well, they played that? off his vertigo. They played off of his trauma. But he would still stick that. around to see maybe, you know, when the people showed yes. up and they got the body and identify the body, they assumed he wouldn't do it. He'd run away, which is a weird thing to do. There's but a couple he of things. He probably that, shouldn't have been there because, of course, he, he was not supposed to be messing around with his with his buddies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. There's, okay. there's, a, there's, a lot that one. there's many there's many levels or many layers to this mystery. Yeah, there is. There is. No, it's a great question. It was, was going to be on my list, but I sat there and said, it's just. You know, it's too obvious with vertigo. You know, I just want to, like I said, when I've done stuff with you in the past, it's kind of like I try to grab stuff from high on the outside and just try to grab some weird stuff to expose, you know, the viewers to this thing. So, anyhow, am I up? No, I think I am. Yeah, he's gone. Oh, you are. I'm sorry. I apologize. All right. Hold on. Got to do this right. Here we All go. right. You're handling Number the cards very well. Oh, so fast. fast. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> this movie uh -huh, sucks. Just kidding. This movie sucks. Uh, that's 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 why you're that's why you're the king of like whatever you're doing here. That's, that's <laughs> get that out of here. Oh, there you go. You're taking my thunder, brother. <laughs> Number one, I would lie to myself if I did not pick frenzy. Oh, yes. Great. Yeah. So let's talk about boobs. <laughs> This movie lovely, lovely, <laughs> lovely, and you know, five minutes into the movie, that you're seeing a different kind of Hitchcock movie. Oh yeah, because the dialogue in the bar right away, he's always pulling your tits. Why are you always fingering me? 
okay yeah. <laughs> i see where we're going now it's almost like this is his homage to like dario argento right or, yeah. or hammer or something like that it's like yeah we can push the boundaries just a little bit right and i couldn't get pictures of boobs to show on your show but i got that scene from naked gun okay <laughs> Close enough. everywhere i go I, I i'm reminded of her but this is a thought i got after drinking about 14 beers one saturday about four months ago, and I text Pete about 1 a.m. with my thought. <laughs> Miles from Silent to Grit. This is kind of a gritty movie. Yeah. Even though it's funny as hell. Oh. But Miles from Silent to Grit, he started in 1920 doing silent movies. And he went decade to decade to decade, adapting every decade, film noir, 60s horror, 70s grit movies what other director did did that i can't think of one but his career kind of parallels and this is what i text pete that one drunken night parallels miles davis miles davis started early in the game went decade to decade to decade adapting with everything jazz fusion a little bit of rock he, he ended doing cindy lopper songs and michael jackson songs so, yeah, I think they're, even though uh, he started earlier, Hitchcock, they have parallel careers. That's just my thought. What can I say? But here's my big finish, guys. Are you ready? This is kind of like your mother. Here's my big finish. <laughs> this is a bag of potatoes. Potatoes with a hand. <laughs> Hold on. Big finish. Oh boy. Big finish. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so let's talk about this wonderful scene <laughs> this is the funniest scene. it's okay so uh, so our killer is in the back of a potato truck <laughs> trying to get a lapel out of a dead woman's hand and she's stuck in a bag of potatoes and she has rigor mortis <laughs> and he cannot get her hand open and her feet are going into his face <laughs> and the truck takes off. I'm laughing now. And, and, and I think the worst part, well, there's two worst parts. When he gets his little pocket knife and tries to pry open her fingers by sticking the pocket knife between her Wait, fingers okay. and the knife breaks. <laughs> Like, how long has this chick been dead, man? Come on. <laughs> you, you're amazed you're watching a Hitchcock movie. I know, point. yeah. And then <laughs> he the breaks each finger and it cracks. And not only do they crack, but they go limp after they crack. <laughs> like, you can see they're broken. <laughs> oh, my God. People talk about the shower scene. People should be talking about the potato scene. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that shower scene. This is where it's at. This is a wonderful movie. And the shower scene humor even goes to the dinner scenes. Yep. Now, those dinner scenes, That's when classic. I first saw this movie years ago, those dinner scenes seem like they belong in a different movie. They're slapstick funny. And they kind of explain the plot of the movie. If you weren't paying attention, the, uh, what, what is he, uh, the cop or whatever he is, he explains what's going on to his wife. But there's a scene where he describes what he probably did to the hand, and she has a breadstick and goes, crack. <laughs> it's awesome. It, you Remember, know you what? Try I, to decipher like what it is he's actually eating in those scenes. I mean, she's yeah. Like, and I love when he just spits it out and, and, and quail and just the the most vile shit. <laughs> you know what? I, I I told my wife. I said you got to watch one Hitchcock movie with me. Why I do all this, and I think it's frenzy. She doesn't know Hitchcock from whatever. When it was over, she was like, that was good. <laughs> Wait, getting her in hoot. slowly. Frenzy's a hoot, for sure. She, it's great. And that's my next choice. There you go. That's my number one. And I'll tell you what it's funny is I started out my, my list with The Lodger. Love it. I love you did that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll show you something at the end. My, my closing one is the rarest, at this point in time, the rarest psycho item you could have in your life but anyhow getting back to that the funny thing about Hitchcock when I started out the story I sat there in the lodger we started a story we ended a story and 
frenzy is Hen is is Hitchcock going home? Yes. It was the first film he did in 32 years in England. Went back to England, and he took every nuance. Although I do love Family Plot. Family Plot's a very interesting film. Frenzy is the coup de grace. He took everything he knew. Ma wrong man accused. The black humor, as you have depicted, with the breaking of the fingers and the, the dinner sequences, which are worth their price of admission. Um, the even the camera work. I mean, the point when he brings not spoiler alert when he brings the wrong man accuses girlfriend to give her a place to stay for the night. One of the best murder scenes. Brings ever. her upstairs, and you know, and is the line he gives her is like, "You're my kind of girl." And then they go in the door, and the camera just slowly pans down the steps, and even when the the boob sequence, okay, after the murder occurs, there's this long moment where, you know, John Finch, who was the actor who played the husband, he had left. And you see the murder victim's secretary come back. She walks in the building. You see her go in the door to go into the office. And you just, it's sitting there in silence for like, what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, till she gets upstairs and gets in the office and probably discovers the murdered, you know, the murdered victim. And you hear this blood curdling scream, but you sit there, you, you know, it's gonna happen, but he just, he just, he just nailed it across the board. He pushed every sexual boundary, the rapist thing, uh, the fact where he's not gonna be, the, the villain is not going to be, uh, how's he represented uh, by this matchmaking thing because he has peculiar tastes. You know, it's, it's just wild, huh? But to put it mildly, he's peculiar. Yeah, yeah, but it's just it's it is just him at his best. And I I saw that I remember seeing Frenzy in the theaters, and I saw it in my hometown. And it was one of those days you go to the theaters, and you can watch the you know three o'clock show, and you can stay and watch the five o'clock show. I stayed and watched it twice. And to this day, when I watched it again recently for this uh, for this that show, fell off. <laughs> I, just, wow, I just went. I just went. This is still great, as as technically great, and the nuances are great. With many other films, Frenzy is just wow. That just hits all the cylinders, and I still think it's his best. And it's true. If you want to show a, a Hitchcock film to somebody that has never seen Hitchcock, yep, and does not want to watch black and white and cannot understand this that or the other and you don't want to say look this is the birds and they're going to say well what happened why do you make any more horror films frenzy is the best way to represent hitchcock in the modern sense of the word and that's to me it's a masterpiece in on many levels so there you go frenzy is my feeling it's pete's <laughs> it's actually not it's it's in my honorable mentions though it, oh, it's, okay. I, I have three honorable mentions uh that i've already said that and shadow of a doubt yeah frenzy is a lot of fun a frenzy is probably his most um yeah it's it's because a lot of people think alfred hitchcock old movies if it's you want to see contemporary right if, if frenzy totally fits i mean it's it feels like a 70s movie it's, it's his most violent film it's oh, his most sexually overt film it is just yeah. he pushed the envelope across all he needed was somebody sleeping with their niece and it would have been perfect it would have been a perfect hitchcock film something crazy there are scenes that are very uncomfortable in that film, and there's there are scenes that are absolutely hilarious. And well, uh, that's what he said. That, he said that, that was that was his so thing. He mixed the and disgusting. He's just yeah. As he always said, murder can be fun. Yeah. And he always sat there and said, "You must mix. You must mix extreme stress and murder and horror with laughter. You have yeah. to bring humor into it." So. And once again, he plays on the wrong guy type of thing, right? That's just, always the wrong man pursued. Always the wrong man. Yep. Yeah. So my number one is Notorious. Notorious. Uh, yeah, I love this film. I I love it for a lot of reasons. Um, and, you know, we've already kind of touched on a lot of them. I think it's a fantastic kind of love triangle film. Uh, I think it works as a great vehicle for Cary Grant, who kind of goes against type in this film. He's kind of in the beginning. He's kind of his normal suave and debonair, but I think you feel his pain 
and his real reluctance to do what he knows he has to do for his, in his job and putting this woman that he loves through what she's going through. And he feels awful about it. And you feel his pain. You know, Jamie mentioned it, every scene he's got, you, you'd see that look on his face. And I think Carrie did such a fantastic job. I think in Ingrid Berman, Bergman is fantastic in this film. She looks awesome. She's also, you feel the pain in what she's doing here. You know, she hates what she's having to do. Uh, Claude Rains is fantastic in this movie, as he always is. There's so many great scenes in this film. Uh, I think also kind of like uh, with Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint in the North by Northwest, I think there is great chemistry between Cary and Ingrid in this film. Really good, as a matter of fact. Um, and I just love it. I think uh, the camera angles, there's so many classic scenes. There's so many classic lines. And uh, that last scene is so great. And you, you cheer for that last scene because you're like, yes, he's having the yes. balls to go in and do that. Yes, we got to get these two together. They got to get through this. And I, I just love this movie. Love it. Love but, it. You know, because, because his superiors, the thing that adds to his angst as a character is his, his, his superiors don't give a shit. They don't. She's yep. disposable. She's like, you know, if you are caught the sub, the tape self-destruction 30 seconds, we don't care, but he cares. They don't. She's disposable. And that's, that's what adds to his angst and his sadness yep. and his, yep. his stress. No, it, it is great. I, I, I revisited it and I'm like, like now, I, now I love it, you know, so. You know, there's another thing we haven't even touched on. Uh, and another reason why I want to kind of point out Claude Rains' role in this film. So he is portrayed as the, you know, the bad kind of Nazi guy, right? He's part of this group of Germans, right? We, we're, we're told that he's not a good guy, but in actuality or in acting, he fell in love with this very, you know, much younger woman years ago when she was like a teenager and now he meets her later in life he truly does love her he wants to make a life for her and he's like his when he finds out that she and Cary Grant are working together I mean you the betrayal you could see okay. it all over his face yeah. he is absolutely so all three of these characters get and, hurt tremendously throughout and, and he's a, and he's kind of a mama's boy and the mother who probably is more much more sinister than he is yeah because she yeah, knows yeah. the big absolutely. game she knows the big game and she's trying to protect him. And that's why, you know, not to give it too much away, but this to say he's defeated at the end. Yeah. At the end. And you can tell when Cary Grant shows up, he's looking at him going, he's good looking and young. <laughs> she probably likes him and not me. You know, I can only milk this invisible man thing for just so long. <laughs> now. And I just realized would you would you would you would you since we've been on here for about seven hours right now, um, like a dance marathon in the 30s. Um, <laughs> should would you indulge me for a few moments and let me explain some information I have about Hitchcock and why he's so popular to this day? Sure. Um, I guess, yeah. We're already well over two I'll, hours. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it. That's what I'm saying. We've been on this long, another five minutes it shouldn't kill us at this point. <laughs> So what we have to understand is the funny thing about it is that Hitchcock is still popular today. Not as popular as you think he is, but we mentioned Rear Window. We mentioned um, Vertigo and so forth. And there was, a, at one point in time, there was a thing called the, uh, the, the, there was the five Hitchcocks that were gone, that disappeared for about 20 something years from syndication, from filming. You couldn't see them. And to put it in perspective, to show Hitchcock's popularity from 1980s forward, you have to go back to the 1950s. And Hitchcock, his agent at the time was a gentleman by the name of Lou Wasserman. Uh, Lou Wasserman, to give it a nutshell, eventually he was the head of Universal Pictures. He also ran, which was called MCA, uh, the Music Corporation of America. Now, at one point in time in the 60s, without going into detail, Lou Wasserman was the most powerful man in Hollywood. Not only did he control Universal Pictures, he controlled the biggest talent agency in the world that represented people such as Albert Hitchcock, James Stewart, all these people. He, um, but to go further into Lou Wasserman is not the point tonight. If you wanna know about Lou Wasserman, and the thing about it, as powerful as he was, nobody knew anything about him. Uh, you see a documentary called The Last Mogul, Lou Wasserman, this explains it. But in the 1950s, Lou Wasserman was Alfred Hitchcock's agent as he was with many people, including people like Ronald Reagan. 
And he had cut an unprecedented deal with Paramount Pictures at the time that after eight years from the release of a film, because Hitchcock had a multi-picture deal with Paramount in the 1950s. And he cut an unprecedented deal that after eight years, the ownership of the films would go to Hitchcock and he would own the films outright. This was never known. Now, eight years, mind you, in the world of cinema was the lifespan of a film before cable and home video and stuff like this. Eight years, you could really milk it. So, you know, you'd have an initial release, you may have a secondary release, eventually it's showing a roadshow prints and wherever it may be, but after that it was useless. And that's why a lot of films disappeared because the studios just shit canned them and burned them, they didn't care. So when he cut this deal, people at Paramount going like, who cares? Sure, why not? That sounds like a deal. So we come to, and these there are, there are five films at this point. Now there were six films on Paramount, technically. But five films fall under this clause, which is Rear Window, uh, The Trouble with Harry, The Man Who Knew Too Much, the remake that Jamie talked about, Vertigo, and Psycho. Now, there's a sixth film, mind you, which was called To Catch a Thief. For some reason, that did not fall into this clause. I don't know why. But anyhow, after eight years, he would get these films. Now, we cut to 1963. And his new agent, which is not Lou Wasserman, cuts another deal with now Universal Pictures, who has now obtained the rights to Paramount Pictures, in which Hitchcock would give back Psycho to Universal and also the rights to his television show at that point, which was on its eighth year at that point, probably going up, it lasted 10 years gave those rights back in consideration of a coffin full of cash or boatload of cash or money wise and 150,000 shares of universal stock, which made Hitchcock very, very wealthy and also gave him the ownership to these films and made him the third highest shareholder in Universal, Universal Studios which procured him a space in Universal where he had a bungalow and he had a carte blanche pretty much across the board for the rest of his life. Now, when he got these films, he pulled them from the market and would not release them. Nothing malicious intended. As a matter of fact, he was so adamant about releasing these films. Now, mind you, Psycho went back. The fifth film he got into his control was Rope. So he had Rope, Rear Window, Trouble with Harry, Man Who Knew Too Much, and now Vertigo. These films were in his control and he kept them off the market other than underground screenings of these things. And it wasn't malicious, but even to the point where James Stewart, they were doing a, they were a war, they were kind of uh, giving a ceremony for James Stewart, a film festival thing. And they wanted uh, to be able to get clips from four of the five films that Hitchcock owned, which were some of James Stewart's best work. And Hitchcock said, no way. Not doing it. Didn't, you know, James Stewart never took it personally. That's the way it was. And they asked him why. And it was, he said, for personal reasons. Now, the personal reasons end up becoming a situation where they were insurance policies for his family. If he kept his films off the market, they'll be worth much more. And it was kind of just for his legacy. And so all of a sudden he dies in 1980. His wife Alma dies in 1982. And his daughter Patricia, who mind you is still alive, she's 93 years old, is the executor of the estate. And Universal approaches her and say, we wanna buy these films back. Of which at that time in 1983, she sells them for $6 million back to Universal. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of money to spend in 1983, but guess what? They made about 50 million on the deal with home video and this and that. And even when they went out and re-released Rear Window, it did $9 million in 1984. Uh, Vertigo was like somewhere around four or five, but they made money. And this set off a resurgence of Hitchcock's personal uh, popularity because when I grew up as a kid in the 1960s and I was fortunate enough I guess in my age I remember the Alfred Hitchcock Presents TV series 
And he was a household name. He was all over the place. He was synonymous with anything, anybody, even kids I knew growing up together. You walk up to you and go, good evening. You, you, because he was that popular. You can't even picture a popular guy. He became a celebrity, which he always wanted to be. You know, and he did over a hundred books and so forth over the years. These, these, these mystery books, you know, that have wild covers, like over a hundred of them. There were games named after him. Um, he was synonymous with this. But anyhow, starting with this resurgence of his popularity in the 80s, when they finally released all these films again after being sequestered away, um, they rebooted his entire Alfred Hitchcock Presents TV series in the 1980s recasting classic episodes with new casts, modernizing them, and then at that time, controversial, colorizing his intros and extros from, or outros from the films. Lasted for three years, which brought upon another- this video. Huh? Lasted okay. for three years, kind of like this video? Yeah, exactly. Right? This is gonna be like the trilogy all in one, but then- <laughs> And then also by the 1990s, it brought about this resurgence of recreating his, redoing his films, you know, being remakes of Notorious. They made a TV version of Notorious. They made TV versions, as I said, Shadow of Doubt. Rebecca had done many times, but even the BBC did an actual ad adaptation of the book because Hitchcock really eviscerated the book to create Rebecca, uh, going and culminating, God forbid, with Gus Van Sant's Psycho. But his popularity has never waned. I mean, there are directors that you know, still follow him. His magazine is still in print as of January, 2021. So he's not going away, but that gives you an indication of where, why things were and where they are now. So I just thought you'd be a nice additive here considering I'm like the you know, fact guy <laughs> or something like that. So Better than being the fat guy. Well, I can be the fat guy as well. Trust me, I have a double XL and Norma Bates uh, suit here, so I'm good. And finally, in closing, my Ed, the rarest, the rarest memorabilia you find. Back in the 1980s, I went to Universal Studios, early 80s, actually. And you go to the gift shop. You want to buy gifts for your friends. Do you really want to buy them a T-shirt for a lot of money? No, we'll buy something cheap, right? So you go through, what is the first thing that catches your mind? Well, guess what? They have... Bates Motel ashtrays, motel ashtrays. So you bring them back and here they are. And the thing about it is that over the years, it just says Bates Motel, Fairville, California, the old road. Some, at some point in time, they changed them and said Universal Studios souvenir and put some big printing on it. And eventually they stopped making them. There you go. That's a rare item. Nobody uses ashtrays anymore. So, you know, so no serious offer is, un is not considered. <laughs> I'll pass. <laughs> You'll pass. Beat my feet are killing me. There you go. Yeah. You've been standing but anyhow, it was a lot of fun. Hey, two hours and 30 minutes. This is like Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia the roadshow cut. Our viewers yeah. have the patience to sit through it. I hope you guys do. But uh, thanks for everyone for watching. We appreciate it. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Thanks for watching another edition of the Monsters Den for Jamie Laszlo and Dan Brown. I am Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you next Wednesday. Or next Thursday, actually. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Pete, you